the third public hearing of the subcommittee of the Senate Committee on Constitutional Amendments. Uh, today's topic or agenda involves once again resolution number six, but uh, with a focus on the educational provisions of our Constitution. Uh, good morning, uh, Your Honors, ladies and gentlemen, to my colleagues. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Committee Senior Vice Chair, Senator Amy Marcos, and Committee Vice Chair and Deputy Minority Leader, Senator Risa Ventiveros. Morning, Your Honors. Uh, and for our guests, we have from COCOPEA, or the Coordinating Council of Private Educational Associations of the Philippines, Chairperson Father Albert Delvo, Private Education Assistant Committee, PEAC Executive Director Rodora Angela Ferrer, Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities, or PACU Associate Legal Counsel Attorney Joshua Calaguas, Second Congressional Commission on Education, or EDCOM to Executive Director Carol Marquis, UP President uh, Angelo Jimenez, our uh, alma mater uh, with Senator Amy, President Gigil, uh, former UP Vice President for Academic Affairs and former CHED Commissioner Dr. Maria Cynthia Rose Banson Bautista, former AIM Professor and Chairperson of Regina Capital Development Corporation Dr. Vic Lim Lingan, who I think uh, was also involved in EDCOM 1, sir. So, former CHED Chairperson Patricia Licuanan is here. Ah, uh, yes. Hi, ma'am. Uh, STI College, I Academy Chief Operating Officer Raquel Perez. Former Dean of the Ateneo School of Government and Senior Economist at the Ateneo Policy Center, Dr. Ronald Mendoza. On the way, he's on the way, okay. De La Salle, online, sorry. De La Salle University Chairperson of the Committee on National Issues and Concerns, Dr. Hasmin Liana with Mr. Ricky Kabugsa. Hi, morning. And... Uh, we have also Dr. Gisela Concepcion, Professor Emeritus of the UP, of UP and the Executive Member of the National Innovation Council. Uh, Dr. William Padolina, Mathematical and Philipp Physical Sciences Division of the National Academy of Science and Technology uh, with Ms. Nova Navo. Morning, sir. Dr. Gail McDonald, Senior Consultant of the Arizona State University and former President of RMIT University in Vietnam with Dr. Minu Ipe. Welcome, welcome. Uh, understand you're here for a launch at UST this afternoon, but thank you for making time for the committee. Dr. Gonzalo Serafica, President of the Center for Integrated STEM Education, or SYSTEM. Morning, sir. Dr. Joel Coelho, Professor of Agriculture Biosystems Engineering at the University of Arizona. Online, who is with us online. Uh, and from the Depart government agencies, we have Department of Education, Attorney Bonville Castillo, Philippine Regulation Commission RT, Attorney R.J. Rosales with Attorney Melissa Comaf Comafe. Uh, Ched from Ched, the Commission of Higher Education, Attorney Peter Lloyd Carpio. Uh, did I miss anyone? Did I? Yeah, okay, that, that's about it. So we can start. Maybe I'll ask my colleagues if they have any initial remarks on, uh, on this topic. Uh, no, Mr. Uh, Chair, just listen. Listen, yeah. yeah. Listen. No. Anything Should from we? your end? Uh, uh, I share yes. I uh, if I may, simply because uh, I'll be joining the other committee hearing as well. Um, Mr. Chair and uh, all our resource persons who are uh, welcome to the Senate. Following COVID, um, it's been a matter of grave concern for us in uh, Northern Luzon, um, witnessing the closure and decline of so many private uh, educational institutions. While uh, my father uh, embarked upon the state university system, and we are very proud of the universal access uh, to education, tertiary education law of 2016, we are also fully aware that uh, quality tertiary education and uh, research and development in the finest institutions in the United States and the United Kingdom and uh, many leading private uh, institutions are in fact private and have determined to remain so. It has also been the finding of the ADB that in many cases, public education has been in direct competition with the already beleaguered private institutions. As such, um, I simply uh, wanted to put on record this um, deeply held and abiding concern that we uphold our private um, tertiary institutions uh, through government and policy as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you. That's very well said. Uh, in fact, that's a constitutional injunction, uh, the complementarity of our private and public education. And uh, 
as mentioned by Senator Aimee, the history, the peculiar history of the development of the Philippine education system uh, gives particular importance to the private uh, schools. Uh, Senator Risa, no more? Yeah, thank you. So, okay, okay. We're uh, um, at the outset, perhaps it's uh, important to state that uh, uh, before we actually amend the or seek to amend the constitutional provision on uh, ownership or management and control of uh, um, higher education institutions, perhaps we should aim at greater precision in the language of the amendment, since some of those who read resolution number six uh, interpreted it to mean that Congress would also be able to amend basic uh, education. I think the that's not the intention of uh, the Senate President, Senator Regarda, and myself in filing resolution number six on the education provisions. The intention is to keep basic education in the hands of uh, Filipinos as Commissioner Gascon, uh, the late Commissioner Gascon, who was also the human rights uh, chairperson and the youngest member of the Constitutional Commission says in the records, um, Filipino schools have and Filipino owned institutions uh, play a very important part in the instilling of values and uh, um, the molding of Filipino youth. So I think we want to uh, maintain that uh, that societal or uh, um, public goal. Uh, and we're looking at uh, really, uh, we're considering the possibility of uh, amending the constitutional provision, which currently allows a 60-40 arrangement. And in fact, there is the transnational higher education law, which was passed a few years ago as a, a implementing uh, uh, piece of legislation for that constitutional provision allowing a 60-40 arrangement. So that's where we stand and uh, um, we'd, we'd, we'd uh, love to hear from our experts here. We have quite, uh, as, as in previous hearings, we have a quite uh, distinguished uh, a number of eminent personalities. So without further ado, we'd like to, yes, Senator Issa. Mr. Chair, sorry. Um, since the chair mentioned uh, that most recent point, uh, I'd just like to make it a record that uh, when the time my turn comes. Um, that's actually the first and I would say prejudicial question I'd like to raise because the formulation of resolution of both houses number six could, could actually allow Congress to open up even basic education uh, to foreign, 100% foreign ownership. So I'll be posing uh, that question at the proper time. Salamat, Mr. Chair. That's very relevant. The resolution seven apparently um, we thought it was different, but apparently it's the same, uh, Senator Aimee. Yeah, that's I've been clarified on that. So, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so now, can we hear from uh, our resource persons, and hopefully we uh, have time for everybody? Father Albert Delvo for Cocopea. Uh, Father, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Senator, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, the esteemed participants of this conversation and hearing. As for Cocopea, uh, we have tasked our precedents that comprise Cocopea to discuss the matter carefully and prudently, then the output of which should be forwarded to Cocopea Central Office, and we will come up with our official definitive position. In the meantime, uh, initial conversations from our rank and file uh, are to this direction that we respectfully urge the lawmakers to proceed with caution regarding introducing amendments to the pertinent provisions because this will have a long-standing complicated repercussions implications to the Filipino generations to come. And so Cocopea it maintains the position, it will constructively work with our legislators so that we can, in fact, contribute to the enhancement of the quality of education in the country and at the same time, safeguarding the interest of the Filipino citizens and likewise the learners and students. So that's where we are at the moment, Mr. Senator. Thank you. We understand Cocope is an uh, amalgam of several... Uh institution so it, it might take time to yes, come well, up with it uh, uh, we account for no less than 70 percent of private educational institutions basic and tertiary and if i may be allowed to add uh, we are cautious because if we allow 
foreign uh, foreign citizens to control uh, own and administer uh, the institutions that we are looking at that may be uh, be prejudicial to our Filipino culture uh, values moral and spiritual matters baka it they may be in danger thank you thank you uh father uh not to preempt your comment but uh, could could you raise it with the body or the uh, in the governing body which uh, is coming up with the uh, cons consolidated position what has been the actual experience of those who within the current uh, uh, constitutional bounds of 60 40 uh, 60 local and 40 foreign those who actually have foreign equity or foreign ownership uh, and control uh, of their institutions what has their experience been because uh, that perhaps could be uh, useful uh, for the committee. Well, at the uh, moment, yeah. uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Senator, wala pong complications along that line. Huh? They, they seem to be, uh, they appear to be contented and happy with that kind of arrangement because uh, it serves the interest of the Filipino people and likewise the Filipino citizens. So we're comfortable with that at the moment. But as I have said, we'll be working, uh, we are open to working constructively with the legislators to find ways and means to really level up the quality of education in the country and at the same time uh, safeguard the interest of the nation. Thank you. Thank you. That's much appreciated. Can we hear from Payak now? Uh, Doris, for air. Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Ngara, for this invitation to the PAC. But uh, just to, of course, like... Uh, Clarify, you know, the PAC is actually composed of the CAP president, so that's Father Delvo, PACO president, Engineer Villamor. The ASCO president is uh, Dr. Uh, Betty McCann of Siliman University. So there really has not been any discussion at the level of the PAC insofar as these amendments are concerned. But we're very happy with what Senator Amy Marcos actually said about protecting you know, the private education sector because right now we are really such a beleaguered sector uh, given the the tuition that was implemented by uh, UAQTE. And uh, we also are very happy with the work, uh, Senator Ngara, you know this, of uh, how we really want to pursue operationalization of complementarity. I think that is where PAC is right now, being the co-implementer of the GASPE programs in basic education. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, any invitation from the Senate will be, um, you know, we're very happy to, again, work with the Senate. We resonate with the, with the words of Father Delvo, who sits in the PAC, and rest assured that there will be some uh, discussions on this moving forward. But right now, uh, really, the private ed sector is in very dire straits. Oh, yeah. that I think that started even with K-12, not just with UACTEA, no? because uh, there was a migration uh, from during K-12. And you, you had two years where there was no enrollment in the private sector. Uh, so now we'll hear from Paco, uh, Legal Counsel, Attorney Calaguas. Attorney, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and our uh, esteemed senators. For Paco, of course, we are one with the Cocopea and PEAC and urging our lawmakers to exercise prudence and foresight in their deliberations um, with, the, with regard to this matter. And we thank you for your kind invitation to this forum. Um, as a preliminary, uh, we have observed that some of the amendments may run counter to the other provisions in the Constitution. And we just wanted to point that out, that the Constitution emphasizes fostering patriotism and nationalism. We, of course, acknowledge that these are non-material values and they don't traditionally appear in spreadsheets, but we hope that we are not losing sig uh, sight of their significance when we engage in such discussions. Uh, for PACU, we support the goal of equipping Filipinos with the best training to become globally competitive citizens in the global world. We are supportive and we are glad that there are in initiatives such as the Transnational Higher Education and the U.S.-Philippine Partnership for Skills, Innovation, and Lifelong Learning Program that further this goal. We also support the recommendations of EDCOM2, which are outlined in their year one report. And we are aware that uh, government has resor scarce resources, and we hope that the recommendations of EDCOM2 are acted upon and included in all of this in discussions, crafting policies that affect the education sector in this country. Again, we thank you for the invitation, and we look forward to hearing about the um, 
from our experts today. Thank you. Attorney. Uh, from EDCOM, can we hear from Director Yi? Yes, Director. Hi, Mr. Chair. Good morning. And morning. to our senators Long and to our I'll other see. resource persons. Um, I, I believe we have a deck uh, that will be presented. As you know, Mr. Chair, we have not yet taken this up with the other commissioners. And so this is not necessarily an ed composition, but internationalization is part of our priorities for year two. Yes, yes. We started 12 out of the 28 for year one, for which we have published a report on. But year two, we will really discuss internationalization, particularly in higher ed. What we've done so far to prepare for this discussion is really to do a comparative analysis of existing policies, both in basic and higher education within ASEAN. And that is what we will present today as as well as considerations. So first slide, please. So the in our analysis, the Philippines is one of the strictest countries in terms of foreign ownership in ASEAN, where Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia actually permit full ownership. Only in the Philippines is foreign ownership also stipulated in the constitution. Um, if you will go to the next slide, most of them only uh, indicate the, the maximum foreign ownership via legislation, so not by constitution. Also, the establishment manner for basic education is only incorporation and registration for countries such as Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. However, in the Philippines, it is via legislation. Based on the data that we have so far, although DepEd might have more current data, there are only nine international schools legislated in basic education. Other countries have also provided incentives. For example, Malaysia has given a tax exemption as well as Thailand to attract such type of institutions to come. Next slide. Next slide, please. Our internet is slow, but let me read. Uh, based on the department order number 88 series of 2010 or the revised manual of regulations for private schools in basic education, the establishment is done through legislation as subject to the condition that the school is established for foreign diplomatic personnel and their dependents and for other foreign temporary residents, similar to what is allowed in Singapore. Um, in terms of the student body, it shall comprise no more than 33% as set by DepEd. Next slide. And then for school administration, it actually allows control and administration of aliens who have the necessary visa from the Bureau of Immigration and DOLE, which is distinct when it comes to higher ed. Um, to the point of Senator Angara, we'll go to the next slide, focusing on higher education. Again, in higher education, the maximum ownership in the Philippines based on the constitution, next slide please, um, is 40%. However, in Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand, again, it is only indicated or provided via legislation, and 100% is actually allowed. You will see here that for the Philippines, the maximum that we could do because of the Transnational Higher Education Act is uh, maximum is joint venture, whereas in other countries in ASEAN, it allows for sole ventures. Um, sample incentives include 100% tax exemption on statutory income and 200% tax deduction on investments for a maximum of 10 years. Um, this has allowed them to actually attract 17 offshore campuses to set up in Malaysia, most of which are Australian and UK universities. In Singapore, there are 19 offshore campuses, again, mostly UK and Australian institutions, um, whereas for Thailand, there are exemptions to foreign land ownership. And however, they keep that 50% of the council must be composed of Thai nationals. Next slide. But very recently, through the Transnational Higher Education Act, we've actually opened, permitted, and supported different types of internationalization activities, among them student, faculty, and researcher mobility, program mobility, such as twinning arrangements and joint programs. And there are various um, initiatives of this in the Commission on Higher Education between um, UK universities and among our best Philippine universities, particularly at the graduate level. Um, and then there is institutional mobility, however, offshore campuses, to my knowledge, wala pa po tayong ganitong karanasan masyado. Next slide. 
In the MORFE, or the Manual of Regulations of Private Higher Education of 2008, it says there explicitly that foreign institutions may operate any degree program directly or indirectly in the Philippines, but no higher education shall be established exclusively for aliens, and no group of aliens shall comprise more than one-third of the enrollment. It also says that whatever is in the MORFE that is applied to private higher education institutions shall be applied also to foreign higher education institutions. Um, next slide. Our legal unit, led by Attorney Estrada, collated some of the possible challenges when it comes to um, regulatory restrictions that might be imposed on foreign institutions. So hypothetically, if an institution like Harvard comes to the Philippines, we will need to discuss issues such as um, governance, operations, and curriculum. For governance, control and administration of HEIs shall be vested in Filipino citizens. In terms of operations, it requires um, ownership of school sites and buildings. CHED also has strict policies when it comes to setting of tuition fees using regional deflators. So will that be applicable also to foreign institutions that come here and using what standards? Um, also in terms of school calendar. We also, of course, know based on our consultations with private institutions that there are challenges when it comes to adherence to CHED PSGs. For example, if they come here and they want to teach teacher education, will they be required to follow CHED's curriculum on teacher education, which is now used across all higher education institutions, which also explicitly details curriculum, um, GE courses, classrooms and laboratory facility requirements, even books and number of books. Um, so textbooks are also preferably written by Filipino authors, etc. So these are things to consider. Next slide is comparative analysis of hiring of foreign faculty, something that we know has been an issue and is difficult, particularly in higher education. Um, for both sectors, there is a grant of an alien employment permit and 9G visa. For basic education, we require them to pass the LET, consistent with RA 7836 of 1994, and must be from a country that permits Filipinos to teach. For higher education, um, holder of at least a master's degree and holder of an appropriate professional license. So this might pose difficulties. For example, I know of many individuals who finish their uh, bachelor's degrees in the US and in the UK. When they come here, they cannot actually immediately take the PRC because they will need to account for some credits that are missing. So they will need to still enroll in a local institution despite finishing in a reputable foreign university because of this restriction. So this might be prohibitive. Also, um, we know from experience of other state universities that they cannot even hire dual citizens in our SUCs to allow them to teach. And this is really contrary to the direction of many countries in terms of aiming to attract the best to come to their countries, to teach, to do research, to collaborate. And so these are things that might be um, open for discussion. Next slide. We know from the experience of many countries that internationalization is a tool, but the target and the vision for the education system must be clear and must be articulated so that we can connect this tool to whatever we want to achieve. If it's improving research productivity, if it's improving our standing in um, international rankings, if it is to increase competition in um, higher education or to attract provision of graduate education for areas that we don't have capacity for. Um, that needs to be clear, and that needs to be the anchor by which we will then proceed. Um, allowing foreign ownership is also just a first step. In, even in Singapore and Malaysia, they rolled out very generous government incentives and adjusted their policies to actually attract the best institutions to come. And so this will require other legislation to be able to do this. Um, there's also a need to strengthen the capacity of DepEdJet and TESDA to regulate the possible entry of poor quality institutions. And also, as we've seen in the examples in ASEAN, um, research is actually fueled by industry that is able to use the research. So as an ecosystem, you cannot have a well-performing institution doing research, and it will not be um, sustained if there is no industry that uses that research and partners with, um, with the university. So we need to create that ecosystem for this to actually work. And so allowing foreign ownership is a first step. We also need to maybe make use of this opportunity to review government regulations in a way that enables quality institutions to thrive. So challenges of overregulation and complementarity might be two things that we can also have 
as we proceed in our discussion on internationalization specific to higher education. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. It's a very good uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay, I'm the president of the United T event uh, of the Philippines, Incorporated and Technical Education Skills Development Authority representative, Father Onofre Innocencio. Uh, good morning, Father. Uh, are you ready to give your uh, position, sir? Yeah, Father, go ahead, sir. The interface of Tibet with higher education. And there, this is a kind of reflection that we had from a series of uh, summit that we have. And therefore, it offers another perspective by which we will consider the bill from this aspect. The interface of Tibet program with higher education. And therefore, we are addressing tertiary education not only higher education, because in the mandate of the different sectors, there is a distinction between lower tertiary education and higher education. And this is a point that we need to consider uh, when we try to consider this bill, no? because there is not clear distinction anymore from the program of Tibet program interface with higher education. And therefore, this is what I'm going to bring to the discussion forum. Thank you. That's a good point. Uh, we're really talking, we should include uh, TVET uh, education here because uh, the previous discussion was on public utilities and we talked about the Public Service Act uh, amendments where we are liberalizing certain industries. And definitely those industries will need uh, skilled personnel. And I think uh, that's, that's where TVET uh, comes in. No? Uh, yung binanggit ni KM na ecosystem. You need an, you need to feed into that ecosystem. Otherwise, uh, they might go elsewhere. So uh, next is uh, UP President, uh, Attorney Angelo Gigi Jimenez, sir. Morning. Morning, everyone. My colleagues from the private sector, our honorable senators, thank you for the invitation. I would just like to start with an opening statement coming from the first UP president, a Protestant pastor named Murray Bartlett. He said that the, the University of the Philippines can serve the world best if it serves best the Filipino. Today, University of the Philippines is mandated not only to be the national university, but to aspire and to work to become a regional and global university. This particular provision more than 10 years ago is becoming more, irre more relevant today because this is now a globalized world. Uh, some people call it omniversity now, not just university. In the 1960s, they invented the term multiversity. Today, it's omniversity or uh, what's the name of Facebook? Meta University uh, because uh, we are all global. Uh, let, let me just state that the University of the Philippines, in furtherance to its mandate to become a global university, has over 400 partnerships in 47 countries all over the world, most of them in Asia and even in Africa, where you would expect uh, little. I mean, we have five partnerships in Africa as well, but I'm just mentioning that because it's just the lowest that we are exposed to. And one of the most uh, perhaps notable aspect is that we even host the International Rice Research Institute and we are going to renegotiate because it's about expiring now. And this has provided so many of the advanced uh, researches and made it accessible to our rice scientists at UP Los Banos. The other thing is that even the University of Nagoya has a satellite campus in the University of the Philippines and the University of Nagoya has produced six Nobel Prize winners and uh, just last month, I went to the Universidad de Malaga in Andalusia to open up a office of the University of the Philippines there. I intend to share it with the rest of the educational institutions in the Philippines as our listening post for many of the opportunities for higher education, including funding, especially the Erasmus Mundo funding. Um, we opened it uh, last month. So for us, um, this is our trust, and let me go down to the basic uh, 
particular proposal that was provided to us. Uh, instinctively, I had to think like a lawyer, but uh, and I asked the College of Law to make me this particular, a little bit of a briefing uh, on the issue. But again, to preface the second part of my statement is that we believe that the issue today of foreign ownership is a matter not of constitution or law, but basically a matter of policy. Our position is that the wording of the constitution provides for an expansive enough zone of construction that we might not need to actually even touch its provision as it stands today. However, it may be clarified. Let me just point out that in your aforementioned quotation of Commissioner Gascon in the 1987 uh, records of the Constitutional Con uh, Con Convention, even in basic education, they were not talking of disallowing foreign ownership. They were debating about the level of foreign ownership. So there is no statement in the Constitution that abhors foreign participation in the educational system. It is our position, Your Honors, that the more important question is what do we need from them or what kind of foreign equity? Uh, the 6040 did not come from the constitution as far as higher education. It came from the 12 regular foreign investment negative list. On the, on the, uh, the higher education, transnational higher edu education law, there is a clarification that foreign teachers are not public officers. This could pave the way for hiring of foreign uh, professors in, in, uh, in our country, and uh, especially in government schools because they cannot get tenure uh, as of now. Also, there is a clarification in the THEA, or the Higher Transnational Higher Education Act, that control and supervision is vested in boards. And so this could still support the idea that even in tertiary education, that the, uh, that the most important thing is that there is still Filipino control. I think we have not given up the, on, on that. And I agree with, with, uh, with Senator Angara that concerning the basic education, the idea of control is a little more, more sensitive than in higher education. Let me just end this uh, by saying that talent today knows no nationality. Many countries are recruiting the best talents all over the world to further their own national interest, no nationality. Mm -hmm. Let me just also tell you a development in the foreign field of education that is directly related to the University of the Philippines. Today, I am getting a lot of uh, suggestions and even invitations from foreign schools who have mature technology that they felt that we might be interested, particularly in science and technology, because many schools in the West and in the advanced countries in Asia, and I particularly had this conversation in Taiwan just recently, they no longer have students for their graduate schools, and they wanted us school. They have over capacity in mature areas that we might be interested in. I'm very interested, for example, in micro microchip productions at the National Kaohsiung Which uh, institution? Uh, National Kaohsiung. Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Yes, uh, that, just a specific example. Um, we have a youth bulge. We, have a, we are now in a limited demographic sweet spot. The world is aging. And my, uh, the University of the Philippines is looking forward to fill in and increase our engagement with the rest of the world. I would stop here, uh, Your Honors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President Gigil, and thank you for uh, kind of uh, disassembling or uh, the different elements uh, involved in foreign ownership, uh, faculty, um, uh, governance, etc. It's very useful. Thank you. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, former UPVP, uh, former Chet Commissioner, Dr. Bautista. I'm Cynthia. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning to the senators. So maybe uh, we have an EDCOM to standing committee on higher education with two subcommittees, teacher ed and higher ed, and it has not yet really discussed this matter. 
Uh, but there are two priority areas in our higher ed subcommittee, which are internationalization and research and innovation. For research and innovation, our subcommittee on higher education is partnering with the National Academy of Science and Technology, which already has a lot of proposals that, that should really go into become policy. The sectoral members of the National Innovation Com Co Commission for the science community and for academe and the National Research Council of the Philippines. So I'm happy that we have representatives here from NAST, Dr. Padolina and, and uh, Dr. Concepcion for the NIC, so they may be able to give their preliminary uh, positions. But my comments focus on observations regarding the entry of foreign higher education institutions in ASEAN because of their implications for the Senate deliberations. By the 1990s and 2000s, Malaysia and Singapore were the two ASEAN countries that purposely and strategically envisioned themselves as international education hubs. Malaysia as a knowledge economy and hub for international students in the Muslim world, uh, for, in the Muslim world resolute, resolutely pursuing the restructuring of its economy as a knowledge-based economy that captures higher value added sectors Singapore's strategy evolved over the years in terms of uh, foreign institutions. A cursory look at the list of its 19 offshore campuses, which uh, Carol, uh, E.D. Carol Mark mentioned earlier, suggests different arrangements. So they're not all uh, ownership, uh, they're not, not all of them are concerned about ownership issues. But the common thread being the response of these HEIs to Singapore's strategic needs. So I guess, for instance, Singapore invited, uh, invited is the operative word, invited uh, the Technical University of Munich to set up in Singapore as a hub for engineering programs like aerospace and as an institution to establish joint programs with uh, NUS, like NUS TAMS in architecture program, the Nanyang Technological University TAMS Master of Science in Integrated Circuitry, or MS in Green Electronics. The National University of Singapore invited Duke University for its medical program so that they could develop its medical program and later invited Yale University to establish a liberal arts college since the British education system actually did not have the equivalent of the American GE. They just go directly to their specialization. In both instances, NUS and Singapore's Ministry of Education covered the costs of the establishment, supported it fully. So it's not like they're coming in and bringing in their capital. Some offshore campuses in Singapore are lodged in, pub in public partner institutions. So it's also subsidized by government. Government puts up the buildings in the university. Uh, for instance, they have the Culinary Institute of America in Temasek Polytechnic, Duke and Yale in NUS. Some, like the Australian universities, are really part of their uh, free trade zone agreements so that the top universities will come in. But one thing is clear for both Malaysia and Singapore, the choice of HI is to partner with is selective, targeting top institutions that would help them. In the, case of, uh, in the case of Malaysia, it's really to help them also project the reputation of Malaysia because they were going to attract foreigners, but for Singapore to help them uh, actually with their strategic interests. It is notable that in the case of Singapore, one study suggests that many of the offshore campuses established around two, the 2000s were set up with very limited time frames. So that includes Yale, having recently been announced to be terminated, for instance, their Yale relationship. Uh, and then, um, accordingly, the country has more strongly regulated, uh, they have strongly regulated their foreign providers' access to higher education. Uh, in, the, in the last few years because they're now sure about what it is that they want from their higher education institutions. So selectivity in terms of strategic contribution to the country's socioeconomic goals and high reputation to further enhance the perception and reality of quality HEIs are operative words. 
as, an, as, as ASEAN's de facto education hubs at this juncture, top foreign universities are attracted to establish offshore campuses in Malaysia and Singapore because of a favorable education and business environment, like incentives, the ease of doing business, and the existence of a Singaporean and ASEAN market for students. So uh, I guess the Philippines at present is not similarly situated, with a limited number of HEIs recognized by other countries to be of quality, and insignificant, and I think other countries like Australia would say they only recognize this number of schools from the Philippines. With your permission, uh, Dr. Yeah. C, I just want to recognize uh, Committee Vice Chair Senator Bato de la Rosa. Morning, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Pasensya na po. Okay lang po, sir. So, so um, we're not in that position at the moment. We have an insignificant market of Filipino upper to middle, uh, middle, upper middle to upper class Filipinos. We have challenges in easing, in the ease of doing business and addressing corruption. Uh, for instance, for those who will be constructing buildings, procurement issues, etc. Um, the small number of foreign students, uh, and not because of the 30% cap, we really have a small number of foreign students coming here. Well, What's the 30% cap again? Uh, no, could you that, refresh sorry, us? Sorry, so that oh. not the maximum number of foreign students that you can take in. And regardless of that, we really have a few of them. The seeming reluctance of the Philippine government to invest in strategic partnerships and nuanced policies like the prohibition on hiring dual citizens that uh, E.D. Mark mentioned earlier are in disincentives for uh, reputable universities. So it's against this backdrop, Mr. Chair, joint ventures, partnerships in the form of dual degrees, research and innovation programs have been attractive to reputable institutions. I think uh, the pres president, President Gigi already mentioned some of our dual degree programs that are uh, different universities with, rep with uh, partnerships with reputable British universities. The closest we ever had to government investment in a partnership with a top university system that cited the NUS Duke partnership in its justification is the PICARI, the Philippine California Advanced Research Institute, which faced numerous challenges from beginning to end. So I think uh, Dr. Padrino. We finished the cycle of PICARI because I remember it's, there it, were. It, the, when the turnover to the new administration, the previous administration, there was some resistance to it. So I don't remember kung natuloy ba yun. They finished, Yung, they finished there was three cycles. There were supposed to be three cycles. So I, think, they, no? I think they finished the cycles, but they're calling it by another name now. It's called Lakas. Okay, so, um, so we have to learn from this. And if you have to open up to foreign HEI, we are open to foreign HEIs. If you have to open to outsource for it, they must be addressing clear strategic goals. Uh, it's like, it's like uh, Singapore needed engineering, needed to beef up its engineering, so they invited, I guess, that might be by invitation. To my mind, what we must guard against is opening up to lower tier HEIs, which is a possibility, because we are not a market for the higher tier yet. Or we, uh, we will not. We are not. Yet, we're not a market for them. So the ones who will come are those who will be uh, of, of lower quality. So we have to actually uh, uh, protect, uh, guard against that which will further erode the reputation of the You're Philippines. saying it should be a race to the top, not a race to the yeah. bottom. Huh? Because, because, yeah. because our reputation is, is not as good as we imagined in the 1970s. Our reputation for diploma mills is very high, and uh, we, want to, we do not want to erode that. So while safeguards may be put in place through legislation and executive orders, I guess we also have to be careful uh, to be mindful of our implementation track record, a culture tolerant of circum circumventions of regulations, lack of capacity of regulatory bodies to regulate substandard HEIs, even among the Philippine HEIs. Uh, they are among the considerations, also the positive or adverse impact on the private education crisis must also be part of the considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you, could you share maybe, because it's uh, Ma'am Tati's also here, you were in the commission together when you started uh, PICARI. What, what, are the, what are the learnings from that, pros and cons? You mentioned uh, it should be more targeted. So maybe uh, but, but wasn't that already targeted towards uh, science, STEM, and uh, research and innovation? Mr. Chair, if I may be allowed to share, because I was... Of course, sir. Yeah, Dr. Padolino, please go ahead. Uh, and uh, at the Honorable Senators. Uh, Picari was a novel attempt to 
try to uh, get, get some kind of uh, uh, shot in the arm to, with uh, our uh, R&D programs in, uh, in the Philippine higher education institutions. Um, it was focused on two areas, uh, the health innovation and translational medicine, and uh, uh, information infrastructure. And uh, through the uh, good uh, connections of uh, Mr. Dado Banatao, we were able to connect with University of California, Berkeley, a very highly ranked institution. Uh, uh, we, we did learn a lot of lessons. The first one was really on the matter of negotiating and dealing with American universities. And if we want to deal with other universities in other parts of the world, we will also have to learn their administrative cultures. Uh, but we also found some practices that we would probably be able to adopt in order to enhance our research environment. Um, uh, but, of course, our relationships with them were very much affected by the pace that we could uh, uh, adopt because they work faster in, because their system is more mature. Uh, and so there were, there were some delays. Uh, I could not attribute all of them to procurement, but there were some institutional policies, internal, that uh, needed to be tweaked in order to uh, keep pace with the, with the kind of activity that we had at the other side of the Pacific. So those are the two major lessons, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, that I could share for now with regard to Picardi. There are more, of course, but uh, for now, I, I, would, I would end there. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, just, just to put it on the table, uh, for, you can answer it uh, now or later, uh, Your Honors. But really, we're concerned with the larger goals of the program and how successful were we in achieving these, meaning a technology transfer, maybe uh, creating uh, new industries or helping existing industries uh, move further along in terms of value adding among others, you know, things like that. Because, uh, you know, the, the conversation about an ecosystem, basically. And, and the, the complaint is we produce a lot of graduates, but there's no ecosystem for these graduates to, to thrive in or to work in. So I think that, that that's the context uh, behind uh, the Picari, and, and we want to assess it that way. And, at, and these constitutional amendments in that sense, because we do, um, the president will probably sign the Tatak Pinoy law in a few days, and that's an attempt at industrial policy. And, and that's because we precisely, that, that wants to address the lack of ecosystems in various uh, industries. So the scientists, the, the more advanced uh, medical professionals, etc., uh, may have uh, a place at home to, to, to work in. So, yeah. uh, Dr. Likwana, did you want to chime in here uh, at any point? Um, Nice to see you again. Huh? Good morning, Mr. Chair, your honors. Yeah, I was just whispering to Dr. Bautista if it would be okay to say this, that basically, well, since I'm retired... And <laughs> I was about to say you're no longer in government, so I think it's okay I to, think say, I'm safe, to say I'm safe, yes, anything, you know? exactly. I think part of our problem with Picari is that we met really, we met resistance every step of the way. It, you know, we, we didn't, we weren't even re, uh, facing our international counterparts yet. But here, and right here in these hallowed halls of the Senate, there were so many skeptics that were saying, what? Can you eat research? You know, what's it for? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we have to look at that too. The ecosystem requires also support from the very top, the, the policy makers. And that was not enthusiastic, I must say. Sorry, thank you. I, I, I remember that. I remember that. Uh, because the budget debate was, uh, was yeah. torture, torturous. <laughs> Uh, there were some years where I sponsored that budget, the higher education. Yeah. I was still a vice chair and not yet the chairperson, so I remember that very well. And of course, some things were lost uh, when uh, the change of leadership, you know. So, 
Um, but 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 yeah, if you could submit something, uh, you know, it's really our first attempt. It, it was, in, a, in a way, it was um, paradigm breaking or shifting because uh, we wanted to move out of our comfort zone and and uh, attempt something new. And of course, th there will be resistance anytime you do something like that. So um, yeah, maybe we can talk about that in detail, uh, greater detail in another time. But but uh, it's good to to learn from it. Um, can we hear from our friends from abroad? We have Dr. Gail McDonald, the senior consultant, because I understand they have an afternoon uh, um, launching uh, there. Dr. Gail McDonald is a senior consultant of the Arizona State University and former president of RMIT University in Vietnam, along with Dr. Minu Ipe. Yes, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Senator Angaro. Um, can I say that it's a real honor to be here, and I applaud each and every one of you in this room who clearly have a passion for education as a public good and as a mechanism of both economic and social development. So your considerations here are quite genuine and are clearly aimed at strengthening the capacity within the Philippines. I would like to speak in a personal capacity as a former president um, of RMIT Vietnam. So that's a university that has been operating in Vietnam for over 20 years. And as you saw, the Vietnamese government has been open to bringing in foreign universities, although they have restricted They've been quite selective, and particularly in regards to putting barriers to entry in the form of the financial investment, the level of financial investment that these universities need to bring with them as they come into the country. So I would like to just mention some of the advantages and disadvantages that uh, you might be deliberating on uh, in regards to bringing in foreign universities and entering into the Philippine uh, higher education and tertiary environment. So the first one is clearly the benefits are around knowledge and tech transfer because you can provide very diverse educational offerings, programs that might not be available locally. And that obviously gives the opportunity of building local capacity uh, and in both students and also in staff. And that was the situation that we experienced when we introduced uh, megatronics and robotics. So that was relatively new to Vietnam, and I believe more recently in the area of aviation. The second is in regard to quality education. If you are selective in who you bring in, and these organizations have got rankings, for example, in the Times Higher Ed, they've got established research cultures, you can actually bring in a lot of knowledge and expertise in regard to quality and quality frameworks. So they come with those already well established in their ecosystem of their own university and are often willing to share those experiences and those standards. I personally have also been asked to contribute to legislative changes within Vietnam. So I was asked my opinion on various um, uh, components of new decrees. For example, they were looking at what should be the percentage of staff in higher education that had PhDs. And I was able to provide benchmarking, international benchmarking, accommodation for the local environment and give some recommendations that then got built into the legislative structure. So as a foreign university, I was asked and willingly contributed to those sort of legislative changes that were occurring. Another advantage is obviously the internationalization, which is clearly a initiative within uh, the Philippines at the moment. So it does open up a two-way corridor between uh, universities and their networks outside of the Philippines, and then opening up to opportunities within the Philippines. So there's a cultural exchange, there's a global learning environment that becomes established. Another advantage is clearly the economic impact. When you establish a new university, you establish jobs, you attract students, you contribute to the local economy, you pay taxes, unless you get some tax incentives, which would always be quite favorable, uh, and you can also encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. 
So there is a, an economic multiplier that clearly is in existence when you bring in a foreign university. Um, there's also greater opportunity of employability uh, because what you often have is students doing what's called a two plus one. They will actually spend two years in the foreign location, but their last year at their choice, they have the opportunity to go to the mothership or the mother country, and there they are able to get uh, more international experience, and they're often, if they're, for example, in Australia, they're able to also get work experience. So there is an opportunity of increasing their employability. And you've also got networks that extend out into the industry partners. So for those universities that come into a new environment, they bring with them their own industry partnerships, which are already well established. Now, I should mention the disadvantages. In all honesty, there are some disadvantages. One is that you often get brain drain. As students that go overseas don't necessarily come back. So that is a very genuine concern where talent can go abroad and you can lose it. But you never know. The appeal of home is always quite great and often uh, people do return after their study. Uh, you can create a, a bifurcated market in that you've got foreign and local universities, but if it is set up correctly, it should be um, a situation of sharing of knowledge and systems, processes, policies. There is another potential concern, and that is that you can end up with the university working under two regulatory environments. So, for example, I had MOAT, the Ministry of Education and Training in Vietnam, and all the regulations that went with that, and I also had uh, Tesca in, in Australia as another quality assurance and a regulatory body. So they were quite different uh, quality frameworks, and I had to work with both of them. But often there is a spillover effect as one learns from the other. And so that is a positive outcome. I think that uh, there's been concerns about cultural dominance, but when you have a strong culture, it's really um, more of a sharing of cultural experiences rather than cultural dominance. And the norms and values are always very strong in an indigenous context and are very hard to overcome. And in fact, often foreign universities go out of their way to embrace local traditions uh, and norms and values um, as being part of a good corporate citizen. So I think that the question that you're probably deliberating at the moment is on a continuum. Do you look at building local capacity um, and uh, enhancing existing organizations? Do you go to the other extent, um, opening up quite generously for foreign entities to come in? Or do you sit in the middle and perhaps selectively pursue organisations of quality that have perhaps had past experience in entering into a foreign market and actually have assets, educational knowledge and research assets, which could be of value to the country? So um, I look forward to watching your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. That's very useful, uh, Dr. MacDonald. Uh, Dr. Padolina, are, you, are you, you finished, or did you want to add to what you said earlier, sir? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair yeah. and honorable senators. Um, the views that I will express are limited by my own and do not necessarily re reflect the position of the National Academy of Science and Technology. Um, the knowledge economy is sustained by a workforce that has two overarching attributes, namely the ability and knowledge to produce in a sustainable manner globally competitive next generation high valued technologies, products, and services. Let me repeat, globally competitive next generation high valued technologies, products, and services. The second attribute would be fostering social and economic resilience by discovering and creating adjustments
to minimize, if not avoid, the negative impacts of disruptive events, natural or man-made, especially on the effects of climate change and the disruptive technologies. The work for, this workforce must, by necessity, be talented, ingenious, and adaptive. Attributes gained through an educational system that is capable of providing the updated knowledge with a global perspective that will allow the Philippine workforce to cope with present and future challenges. The intensified global movement of the knowledge base, the students, professors, instructors, academic programs, educational providers, in the form of collaborative arrangements, campus branches, franchises, and joint degree programs, has motivated several countries in our region to be the premier educational hub in Asia. Some ventured to prepare for that role even in the early 90s and have reached some significant milestones, while a few have realized the importance of an accelerated approach to improve the skills of their workforce before they become victims of the fast-changing global economy. It remains to be seen whether the Philippines will be successful in establishing a niche in the international knowledge enterprise. I understand Ed EDCOM 2 is in the process of identifying the challenges that we face to reform our educational enterprise, requiring nothing less than a systems approach to effect changes at all levels, from K to 12, the undergraduate and graduate degree programs and the vocational technical programs. In the light of all these imperatives to cope with the challenges to reform the Philippine educational enterprise, I favor, in principle, the entry of only of reputable foreign-owned educational institutions, subject to a well-defined terms of reference, including the conduct of R&D between domestic and international educational institutions. We can leverage our demographic profile and those of other countries in the region, our proficiency with the English language, and the high value that we place on education. Subject to a rigorous, no-nonsense review of the impact of transnational education in several countries in their quest towards a knowledge economy, the following advantages may be cited. Greatly accelerate our efforts to update our educational system to global standards and enhance the academic quality of our higher education institutions. <laughs> open opportunities to improve the match of knowledge and skills, expand the coverage and improve the quality of our R&D by making expertise and state-of-the-art facilities available in the country. And lastly, support talent retention in the Philippines by supporting a conducive research and teaching environment. Our current talent deficit is retarding our progress. These are just the major advantages for the Philippines to achieve a critical mass of talented, ingenious, and adaptive workforce. May I reiterate my support in principle for the amendment knowing fully well that the entry of foreign-owned educational institutions is a complex undertaking and is not without its risks and unintended consequences, especially in the viability of their operations and the impact of their presence vis-a-vis -vis our local, private, and public HEIs. Thus, we need to be guided by the experience of other countries in order to gain confidence that we can learn to manage this important undertaking and fulfill the establishment of the knowledge economy in the shortest possible time. In effecting the change to the crafting of a new law, 
May I suggest a review of Republic Act 11448, and if still in effect, Ched Memorandum Order Number no. 2, Series of 2008. This particular amendment should be coupled with other initiatives, particular those being discussed in EDCOM 2, to make our educational system resilient, robust, and transformative as an effective force in our journey towards a knowledge economy, sustainably producing globally competitive products and resilient, able to adjust quickly in the face of both the known and unknown disruptive events. This intervention towards a knowledge economy is supportive of the expectations of the science community in its foresight document, Pagtanao 2050, as we work together towards a prosperous, archipelagic, and maritime Philippines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good, uh, Dr. Padolina. But uh, unfortunately, we can't really act on uh, some of those uh, recommendations because they're beyond the jurisdiction of the committee. And, uh, but, but definitely, they are useful, and uh, um, we shall write a note to the respective chairpersons dealing with the, with the higher education, that's uh, Senator Escudero. Uh, and maybe on basic education center, get Chalian. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Liquana, did you want to add to what you said earlier? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if you will allow me, I, I have prepared a statement. Please, ma'am, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. As a citizen who loves her country and worries about its future, I share the dismay of many over all this fuss about charter change at a time when the country has so many serious problems. I'm not convinced that amending the Constitution is the solution to our economic woes. Foreign direct investments are neither helped nor hindered by the Constitution. FDIs that have recently pledged to come into the country did not make charter change a condition for their entry. And those that have chosen to go elsewhere in the region did not give the so-called restrictive provisions of the Constitution as a factor, but rather named issues such as bureaucracy and corruption. These arguments have been eloquently presented at previous hearings and public fora by Senator Risa Ontiveros, economists Winnie Monsod, Shello Magno, and Sunny Africa, and framers of the 1987 Constitution, notably attorney Christian Monsod among others, so I need not go over them. Let me just say that I believe that the time and resources being spent and to be spent on charter change is an unconscionable waste. Focusing on Article 14 on educational institutions, I assume the intention of adding the word basic to education at the start of the section is to apply the amendments only to higher education institutions. My general view as an educator is that this distinction is unnecessary because I do not favor amendments to restrictions on foreign ownership of educational institutions at any level. <clears throat> More specifically, I would like to remind everyone, and Mark has so eloquently reminded us, that EDCOM2 has been convened the Commission has completed its first year and will continue its work for two more years. Let us see what this Commission, which is dedicated to analyzing the situation of education in the country, proposing solutions to problems, and identifying what the system needs in order to develop its full potential to serve all Filipinos, will have to say about foreign ownership of schools. So far, its over 300-page first-year report spells out in no uncertain terms the dimensions of the crisis in Philippine education, but does not even hint at a need for change in the policy on ownership of schools to address these problems. The message to us from EDCOM 2's year one report is, the education crisis is real and it is serious let us not waste any time rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Foreigners holding equity stakes in Philippine schools is not a problem per se. 
since in principle it would provide sorely needed resources for education. The dangers of possible undue foreign influence on students is mitigated by the fact that DepEd and CHED have well-specified curricula and standards. This model is already an option for stock universities, and many HEIs are productively pursuing partnerships with foreign universities, as we have heard around the room. CHED's internationalization policy encourages and supports this. Such partnerships could and should be developed further without charter change. But don't we want to consider what our neighbors like Singapore and Malaysia have done? My view is that the circumstances are different. The Yale National University of Singapore project stands out for consideration. Singapore wanted to develop the creativity perceived to be missing in their otherwise well-developed and high-performing educational system. They approached Yale to create a first-rate liberal arts college in Singapore. Yale provided the curriculum and the faculty, that is, the intellectual capital. Singapore provided the funds in full. Obviously, this model does not apply in our situation. Incidentally, Singapore decided to end the Yale and US project, mainly because it was too expensive. In Malaysia, we see another type of experiment, that of foreign university branch campuses, or FUBCs. These are educational institutions, mainly from Australia and the United Kingdom, that have been invited to set up their branch campuses in Malaysia and provide equivalent quality education. This model works well in Malaysia, where university admissions is quite restrictive because of the limited number of universities. This is not the situation in the Philippines. FUBCs also work in Malaysia, where the level of the country's economic development enables significant numbers of locals to afford the higher tuition charged by foreign universities. Again, this is not the case in the Philippines. Foreign universities, while possibly attracted by our large young population, will soon discover, after careful market studies, that branch campuses in the Philippines will not be sustainable. So my humble opinion, Your Honors, is on resolution number six, is no to amendments to economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution and no to foreign ownership of schools. In other words, no to charter change. Let us stop this wasteful and divisive activity and focus on things that really matter before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, that's very clear, Dr. Likwanan. Um, <laughs> Dr. Limlingan, uh, you want to uh, give your point of view? Thank you. Maybe just to clarify the premise of the hearings. No, it's not uh, presenting charter change as a, a cure-all, uh, meaning it's not saying it's the number one requirement of foreign investors. Uh, in fact, in the first hearing, I said, uh, let's not, even if we change the charter, if we don't uh, address things like corruption, bu bureaucratic red tape, then, you know, it will be for naught. So I think the question must be tweaked a little bit uh, in the sense that um, it's not uh, an, an all or nothing approach, meaning uh, do we need charter change at the expense of uh, um, all the other legislative and uh, administrative reforms. It, it is more of will charter change, will amending the charter help bring us to the promised land of uh, a greater prosperity, etc. So I just want to retweak that because a lot of the arguments, um, even in previous hearings, were: Is this the only solution? It's not. Clearly, it's not. It's not the only solution. But is it a solution? More, more. That's that's the question I'd like to uh, posit to the body. Rather, not is it the only solution, but is it a uh, possible solution alongside a whole slew of other reforms because I'm looking at it as a legislator and uh, I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking we can solve the world's problems but we can only do legislation at the end of the day you know we cannot do administrative reforms we're not an anti-corruption body we can do oversight but th there are limitations so that's why um, I think constitutional reform should be viewed through that lens is it um, will it contribute to the reform effort? Not is it the only solution? Yun lang po, uh, Dr. Limlingan, yeah? where, where are you, if you're ready now? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when it comes to education, 
the first and foremost consideration should be the interest of the student. In fact, uh, in our school, we have a motto which says, ang estudyante ay ang ating among tunay. Because it is the reason why we exist. It's really for the students. Now, with respect to looking after the interest of the student, there are two, two views, no? One is Dr. Mil Milton Friedman, a famous economist who argued that students should be treated as consumers, free to choose the education they want from any accredited educational institution. On the other hand, Henry Ford once famous, famously said that Ford card buyers can choose any color they want so long as it is black. <laughs> this seems to be the policy of our public education because you can, they, we have the same curriculum and the same textbook all over. No? So we would argue for giving students a choice, but giving students a choice become an academic unless they have a variety of educational systems to choose from. This is done in the private schools, but unfortunately not in public schools. For example, as a parent, I could choose to send my child to a traditional grade school or to Montessori school. But with the public schools, I have no choice. As I said, my only choice of color is black. No. This is not the case with other educational systems in the world. In the United States, public schools are operated by school boards, which are part of the local government. Under this decentralized system, school board provide a vast range of choice for students. First, there is the traditional public school. Secondly, there are government subsidies such as school vouchers, so students can study for free in different kinds of private schools. Lastly, there are charter schools, public schools managed by the private sector based on a charter of educational system jointly ag agreed upon by the public and the private. Note that school vouchers are a critical factor in giving students a meaningful choice. If a poor student has to choose between a free public school and a for-pay private school, there really is no choice. As one private school president noted warily, it is hard to compete with free. It is in this light that we take the position that we should allow uh, non-Filipino entities to operate in the Philippines. We understand that this provision has been placed due to national security considerations. If so, other safeguards can be placed by both our educational institution and national securities to take, pla to take this place of this prohibition. For allowing non-Filipino educational entities to operate in the Philippines mean more choices and opportunities for our students. Uh, we will note that the National Education Policy 2020 of India promises higher educational reform in many areas and internationalization is prominent among them. The NEP 2020 recommended allowing foreign universities in, rank in the top 100 categories to operate in India. Therefore, it is for this reason, thinking of the interests of the student, that we are for allowing uh, more choices for the student in terms of allowing them to come to uh, non non Filipino entities to come in and operate in the Philippines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for the examples as well, uh, Dr. Limlinga. Uh, can we hear from uh, Philippine Association of Private Schools, Colleges, and Universities, Dr. Antonio Del Carmen, who's online, I believe. Dr. Del Carmen, can you hear us, sir? Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, yes, from Pop School. Yeah. Yeah. Morning, sir. Uh, Please yeah. go ahead. Well, uh, in behalf of Pop School, uh, we also would like to manifest our position because many of our uh, schools are mainly located in the provinces. These are small, medium-sized colleges and uh, schools in the provinces. And uh, we have this uh, uh, fear or uh, that uh, uh, the, that foreign universities who would come in uh, might uh, 
influence not only uh, the content or the, uh, uh, of our academic uh, uh, institutions, mostly the small ones, but also uh, economically influence uh, the choices of our students and uh, reduce the viability and feasibility of these uh, small schools. You know? We, of course, we are also looking at uh, collaborating and uh, doing joint uh, ventures with these uh, universities and colleges abroad. But uh, our hesitation is on the full ownership of institutions who will open up in our country. You know? So uh, we would like to just manifest uh, and uh, uh, share the, in, the interest of our small colleges and universities, uh, mostly in the provinces. And uh, uh, while we are open to uh, doing collaborative work, especially in research and advancing uh, the use of technology in our schools. You know, uh, we also would like to ensure that our uh, small colleges, especially those who are family owned, you know, uh, can continue to thrive uh, in this environment of uh, continuous uh, learning for our students. You know? So uh, we would like to continuously uh, pursue this conversation uh, with our foreign uh, institutions as well as uh, discuss the possibility of doing collaborative work. No? Ownership may be another issue that we should uh, tackle, but we are open doing collaborative work with these uh, other institutions. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Del Carmen. Uh, can we hear from STI College? We have uh, I Academy COO Raquel Perez. Morning. Morning. Th morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I may be allowed to read our statement, sir. Go ahead. Good morning, honorable members of the Senate, uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, it's nice to see familiar faces. Today, we gather to deliberate upon a matter of utmost importance, the state of the educational sector in the Philippines and the potential need for charter change in response to its myriad challenges. As we navigate through this discourse, it is imperative that we remain steadfast in our commitment to uphold the interest of our nation's youth and the future generations that they represent. As an educational institution that operates nationwide, we, are, we have about 67 campuses for SDI, two campuses for, for I Academy. We understand the significance of aligning educational standards across different branches or campuses. However, we recognize that true progress begins at the basic education level. While we thrive to provide excellent facilities and interventions at the tertiary level, we acknowledge that without a strong foundation in basic education, these efforts may prove insufficient. Before driving into our stance, I wish to underscore two significant concerns within basic education that demand our immediate attention. Firstly, inadequate resources such as classroom facilities continue to hinder the effective delivery of education in many parts of our country. The lack of sufficient infrastructure not only limits access to quality education, but also compromises the learning environment of our students. The absence of proper facilities uh, in institutions remains a persistent challenge, contributing to disparities in educational outcomes. Second, this the issue of teacher quality is of paramount importance in shaping the educational landscape of our nation. In a World Bank study revealing the inadequacies in math proficiency among public school teachers underscore the urgency of addressing this issue. Teachers serve as the backbone of our educational system and their motivation, training, and conversation are vital in assuring the success of our students. Our stand is clear. The current problems plaguing, plaguing the educational sector do not necessitate charter change, but rather demand greater support and attention directed to education. Allow me to elucidate upon our stance and provide a more overview of the prevailing issues and proposed solutions. First, let us address some of the prominent challenges facing our educational system today. These include the placement of graduates and career pathways, job mismatch, and the alarming dropouts rates attributed to the lack of access as early as early childhood care and support. These issues underscore the need for intervention, but our focus should primarily be on bolstering basic education as it serves as a foundation upon which all further learning is built. We acknowledge the proposal of charter change, particularly regarding the ownership and management of educational institutions. While there may be arguments in favor of re relaxing 
restrictions on foreign ownership, we must exercise caution and prioritize the preservation of Filipino values and the cultivation of national identity. The Constitution mandates the inclusion of the study of our nation's history, constitution, and values in the curriculum of all educational institutions. These foundational principles are best instilled by Filipino educators who understand the nuances of our cultural heritage. Furthermore, allow our grating foreign control of education may not address the root causes of our educational challenges. Inadequate resources and the lack of properly motivated, trained, and compensated teachers may remain pressing issues that must be addressed comprehensively. Basic education is not being given the appropriate priority as evident by insufficient infrastructures and issues raised by the recent report of EDCOM 2. Dropout rates remain alarmingly high at 4 out of 10 learners dropping out by grade 10 with significant barriers to access and completion faced by marginalized communities. We cannot afford to overlook these challenges by diverting attention towards charter change when the real issue lies in the lack of resources and support. Moreover, while foreign investment in higher education may bring about certain benefits, we must remain vigilant against potential pitfalls such as commercialization, brain drain, and widening socioeconomic disparities. Any initiative to enhance the quality of higher education must be carefully balanced with measures to safeguard national interests and promote equitable access for all. In conclusion, we urge this honorable institution to prioritize the needs of our nation's youth and invest in the foundational pillars of basic education. We echo um, suggestions from Dr. Bautista by E.D. Uh, e to improve the ease of doing business, perhaps review some regulation and policies and regulatory bodies. Charter change should not be pursued as a panacea for the systematic challenges facing our educational sector. Instead, let's focus on ensuring that every Filipino child has support and access to quality education, facilities equipped with knowledge and skills, and values necessary to thrive in an ever-evolving world and contribute meaningfully to our society and uphold our nation's heritage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. That's very well said, but again, a lot of the recommendations are beyond the jurisdiction of this committee. <laughs> so if we could just focus on that narrow question uh, before us, which is the question of constitutional change and whether it will help or hinder us, uh, or whether I think one thing clear is uh, from all the resource persons or from all the hearings, a theme is a recurrent theme is that uh, um, we are the only ones who have these restrictions in our constitution. Um, and uh, a, a theme that emerged today so far, an emerging theme today, is the need for targeting, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Padolina, Dr. Bautista, uh, and other resource persons. So, so that, to me, seems to be an argument to, to, to take it out of the Constitution and place it in legislation. So to have greater precision um, and uh, um, greater, to, achieve, to be able to achieve our aims. Uh, uh, just an impression. Uh, 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 maybe our resource persons could, uh, if, if they have any comments. Yeah. Could we have Dr. Concepcion, Dr. Gisela, former VP of UP and of course Professor Emeritus at UP and executive member of the National Innovation Council. Yeah. Ma'am. Thank you, uh, Senator Angara. Good morning, Senator uh, Risa. So um, I'd like to present uh, my proposal to build the suprastructure so this is a continuum of um, higher education, the tertiary, and the postgraduate levels uh, as they relate to R&D and innovation. In the university, uh, well, with due respect to our president, uh, Gigi Limenez, uh, the three mandates uh, we uphold are education, teaching and learning, research and creative work, and service public service, but also private uh, service, okay? And the queen of all of these uh, activities would be new knowledge generation or creation because this infuses, enriches our teaching and learning and our service. And so I think that uh, we must invest in the superstructure, and I use this term uh, to uh, complement the infrastructure that uh, the legislature invests in a lot. Uh, now, do we invest enough in superstructure? Okay, so, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, this is uh, data that cannot be denied. 
Uh, it's UNESCO data that's quite old, but it remains true. So on the uh, left lower, right lower quadrant is uh, the link between GDP per capita and R&D. And um, Philippines is the blue triangle. So our GDP per capita today is about 3,500 US dollars. And um, our uh, GERD, our gross expenditure for R&D is 0.32%. And uh, the other dots you'll see are for the United States, for Germany, and for Japan. And their GDP per capita are in the 60,000, 50,000, 40,000. Next slide, please. There is uh, an imperative to uh, consider R&D and innovation a top national priority. And uh, so um, the NIASD, that's the uh, National Innovation uh, uh, Agenda and Strategy document, uh, that the NEDA came up with um, is um, showing us these core targets. And it's good that the, the government has already acknowledged that we need to uh, attain these targets. So um, the root cause of all of our problems is a lack of investment in the human capital, the human talent pool. And uh, right now, uh, by the WIPO data, we only have 174 full-time equivalent researchers per million population, and we want to move that up to 500 by 2028 and to uh, 1,000 by 2032. And our GERD is 0.32% uh, of GDP. We want to move it up to 1% of GDP and uh, to 1.6% of GDP by 2032. Next slide, please. Now, uh, those core targets, if achieved, would allow us to also achieve the other uh, core targets. And it's nice because this document shows us our knowledge and technology outputs and our creative outputs. And uh, they're data generated by um, you know, the GII. So uh, this has been uh, recognized by our government, by NEDA. Next slide, please. So um, now let's do the comparison. Uh, again, the data is uh, from uh, the WIPO. And our uh, information is in the blue column. And uh, we are being compared and contrasted with Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam and we're actually being benchmarked with Indonesia at the present by the ADB. But uh, let us tell you uh, what we have in the country, and uh, there is great opportunity because we have uh, graduates in science and engineering of 22.8% of total graduates, and I'm trying to get that number of total graduates from the CHED. But uh, I just got this from the PSA, 1.1 uh, million uh, high school graduates go into the academic track, and 500,000 go to the tech voc track, and we don't know what the uh, graduation rate is. We know there is, a, a, you know, not 100% or even close to it. But if you uh, go by these numbers, there are enough uh, STEM graduates that we could um, move or channel into the postgraduate level, which would be required for um, uh, independent research and innovation. So in UP, we are trying to increase the number of PhDs among our faculty. So when I was VPAA of UP, I aimed to move it from 30% to 50% to reach Thailand's requirement of 70% for national universities and Malaysia's requirement for 90% uh, for their national universities. Okay. But Sorry, uh, just to clarify that requirement. Yes. yes. Uh, what is the, what are we requiring? Sorry. PhD uh, level number of faculty. PhDs from state universities, from national universities, public universities. For a national university to be, uh, uh, you know, just identified the, the main as university. National. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Thailand, at least seventy percent PhD 70, faculty. Seventy. Seventy. And Malaysia, ninety percent. By now, it's a hundred percent. Okay. And, it's a little um, challenging, uh, President Gigi. Po, kaya po yun yung ano ngayon eh, banner, banner ano ni President eh, increase the number of PhDs in UP. Okay, so anyways, um, that's um, uh, 
number of researchers. We are 174 researchers per million population, and di po lahat yan PhD. Look at Thailand, they have 10 times our number. 1,790 per million population. Vietnam has four times our number, Madam uh, McDonald. Four times. Indonesia has uh, about double ours, okay? And then for our GERD, well, Indonesia is the same level, but it's got a huge GDP, huge GDP. Of course, their population is also uh, bigger, but we're, you know, catching up, like 115 and they're 200. And then look at uh, Thailand invests 1.1% and Vietnam invests 0.5%. This data is probably not the most accurate. It's 2022. Next slide, please. So what good is infrastructure without the suprastructure? So in my closing remarks at the NIASDI launch last September, I uh, you know, championed this goal to increase our experts to 500 in 2028, to 1,000 um, uh, per million population in 2032, and to increase our GERD uh, from 0.3% to 1% by 2028, and with a GDP of the Philippines in 2022 of about $400 billion, and it has grown larger in 2023, and we expect it to grow even more, Current GERD of 0.3% of GDP translates to USD $1.2 billion. How much more do we need to spend for GERD? $2.8 billion more. Now, what good is spending all that $2.8 billion if you do not have the PhD level experts who can make use of that money very well? Bottom line is it's all about the people. It's all about talent, development and retention. Next slide, please. So, we know that the government is uh, championing digitalization. Okay, and FinTech, Digitech, of course, Space Tech, and AIIT expert, expertise. That's very important, but I said to our entrepreneurs, startups, venture capitalists, MSMEs, and future innovators among our youth, we wish to see you transform your ideas into reality. We hope many more will pursue and invest in higher value agri-tech, aqua-tech, biotech, food tech, health tech, energy tech, materials tech, climate tech, recycling tech, aside from those other virtual techs. And many enterprises engaged in social innovation be the prime movers of social economic transformation of communities through the growth of circular economies in rural areas of our country. So innovation is not just about utilization and commercialization for CROI. It's also about social return on innovation in uh, our communities in the regions. Next slide, please. So these are all guesstimates, are estimates, but they're very, um, I think, revealing and very, very um, meaningful, at least to me. The GDP of the Philippines, as we said, is about 400 billion. At a population of 115 million, GDP per capita is 3,500, and that's searchable, we know that. Now, we were told that 35% of the Philippine GDP, or 140 billion, is contributed by 1.9 million MSMEs, which I consider to be our middle class. This translates to about 74,000 US dollars GDP per MSME. Okay, we know MSMEs, they, they can really be micro, small, or you know, medium. Assuming an MSME spends 50% for employee wages and an MSME has 15 employees, these are all assumptions, each employee earns $2,500 a year or $210 or 12,000 pesos a month. What about marginalized communities in the Philippines? They do not earn enough income. Coconut farmers until today earn 5,000 a month. Farmers and fisher folk are the poorest communities in our country. So what has superstructure got to do with this? Productivity, quality and quantity of produce, of products, of services and systems, of MSMEs and farmer and fisher folk communities can be significantly improved with advanced innovative technologies. Next slide, please. So my proposal is to develop the Philippine suprastructure by building the Philippine Advanced Technology Innovation Institute for Industry. Uh, Secretary R.C. Balisakan nicknames it 
Patty Cube. So he supports this, and so does the DTI secretary and the innovation workforce. And this provides you the brain flow. It provides you the two-way corridor, okay? People coming in here and our own uh, most talented, uh, brightest students going out and hand-holding them, shepherding back them back to the Philippines uh, with the right incentives, okay? So a definitive massive investment in superstructure, advanced s and human capital development, recognizing its singular most critical role in driving and sustaining over the long term innovation-based competitiveness of Philippine industries. And this is aligned with the priorities of the Asian Development Bank, to which I wanted to you know, submit this proposal, and the administration of President uh, Ferdinand uh, Marcos Jr., which would be agriculture and food security in the context of climate change. So here we propose the establishment of an innovation institute and a massive postgraduate study abroad program. Next slide, please. Investing in the human talent pool, the critical role of s and human capital development to sustain technological development and economic progress over the long term, improve the quality of life of a population is recognized in all technologically advanced countries. It's the single most important definitive investment for sustained progress. Development of the human workforce or human capital resources, the advanced education and training of its brightest youth. Next slide, please. We have models. We have models abroad. Okay. So we have them in uh, Japan, South Korea, China, Taiwan, India, Pakistan, and Asian countries such as Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, who have invested in s and HCD, sending thousands of their brightest students to the US and Europe for advanced studies. It's a numbers game. Taiwan sent 30,000 of their uh, best and brightest decades ago. 3,000 came back and they made all the difference in Taiwan, including Morris Chung of MIT and Stanford and Texas Instruments, who set up uh, the uh, Taiwan Semiconductor uh, Company, TMS, largest provider of semicons in the world, the wafers, okay? Challenge in the Philippines is to directly link the creation of s and knowledge and innovation with utilization, commercialization, and economic prosperity. And for our model, we could do the Fraunhofer model of a public-private partnership for applied research in business innovation in Germany. The link between scientific research and entrepreneurial growth is very close and well-structured. So this is from the website. Every euro of public expenditure invested yields three to four euros in GDP. Oh, that's very tough, but it's being achieved. And postgraduate studies, thesis and dissertations, and RDB programs can be modeled after those in the Humboldt universities and Max Planck research institutes in Germany, Riken in Japan, Academia Sinica in Taiwan, done in partnership with universities. I'll tell you at this time uh, from my SWOT analysis what the threats are. So we do have uh, bright grassroots talents in our country in the University of the Philippines and other souks all over the country. They still speak English well. We have a very young population. So what is Germany, what are other countries doing? They are recruiting them. They are already recruiting them directly because these countries have very low populations. They have a, a reduced populations now. So, you know, they're just trying to get our best and brightest. So what do we do to stem this, this you know, uh, threat, threat that we are facing? Next slide, please. What are the antecedents in the Philippines? This one we have to recognize. Let's just accept it. You know, we did not do well. No massive investment of the Philippine government postgraduate studies abroad of its best and brightest from the 1960s and through the decades. Nothing, none. Instead, reliance on relatively few foreign scholarships. Rockefeller, Ford Foundation, Fulbright, World Bank, East-West scholarships. Significant number of these PhD graduates in the 70s and 80s did not come home for good. There was nothing to come home for. So it's really chicken egg. The government did not handhold, did not provide the opportunities here. Programs that did not make a lasting significant impact on knowledge creation in the country, I just have to identify them. And I will mention Ched uh, Picari later, uh, Mam Tati. SF, foreign PhD scholarship program in the 80s and 90s, just a few came home and they made some difference. PhD consortium of UP, Ateneo, La Salle, and USD in the 80s and 90s, you 
you know, moderate success, but it didn't make a, did not provide a critical mass. Establishment of the National Science Complex in UP Diliman and the National Science Consortium in the mid 2000s, okay, led, helped by uh, the late Congressman Villafuerte, and the establishment of the ERDT uh, program in the mid 2000s with, uh, with a sponsorship of the late Senator Ed Angara. Next slide, please. With all due respect, President uh, Gigil, I have to present our graduation data of the UP graduate programs. Also, uh, due respect to uh, VPAA uh, Cynthia Bautista. This is our graduation rate in UP. Doctoral, 193. Masteral, 1,517. So we don't even have 2,000 graduates in UP in 2023. So I got this from our AVPAA. Next slide, please. What is the national budget in 2024? I read it in the papers. It's 5.768 trillion, or that's about 100 billion US dollars, okay? So what is my proposal budget for building the superstructure? It's only 1 billion US dollars, but that's not even uh, to fill what we need in terms of our full-time equivalent researchers, MS and PhD levels, um, because if you are to address uh, the NIASDI core targets by 2028 and beyond, uh, first we need the 2.8 billion to spend. We need to uh, spend, and that is why we are here, uh, uh, Honorable Senator, because it's legislature can pass the law uh, over the long term, provide a justification for budget allocation. But initially, this is being, uh, well, uh, pursued by the National Innovation Council, the executive branch of government. So, um, as we said, what good is the 2.8 billion if you don't have the research leaders? So, we need 326 full-time equivalent researchers per million population, or with a population of 150 million, you need 37,000 plus FTE researchers. Next slide, please. What are the foreign models? This you are familiar with. You are familiar with the MIT Harvard Nexus and the Silicon Valley Stanford University of California System Nexus. You see that's why we, uh, you know, we worked with uh, Picari. You know? Small business innovation research, SBIR grants to researchers are a major investment in innovation of the US government, which has yielded numerous commercialization success stories. And one of our recipients of the SBAR is none other than Dr. Gonzalo Sarafica. We work together in the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. So he's a recipient of this. The explosive growth of biotechnology industry from the nascent stage in the last decades is attributed in large part to SBIRs. $100,000 and the next tranche $750,000. Successful cases of engagement of leading private US universities, universities in foreign countries are well documented. We already heard it from uh, Dr. Cynthia Bautista and others. But I'd like to point out one of our top scientists who is a plant geneticist, Rice, uh, geneticist at that. He's uh, Michael Purganan, our graduate from chemistry, just like me. And uh, he was Dean of Science of New York University and also a leader of the NYU Genomics Institute. And he was asked to set it up in Abu Dhabi. And he was able to do it for $10 million over uh, five to seven years. And he was awarded the, the, the nation's top science award because of his uh, efforts. I'd like to add Singapore's USD uh, 30 million investment in the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, smart group in Singapore, which eventually led to the establishment of the highly successful Singapore University of Technology and Design, currently graduating hundreds of engineers annually with SUTD topping MIT's list of emerging engineering schools. So it's just telling you the ripple effect you know, the amplification effect is so important. You may not want uh, the foreigners to be here forever or, or even in the lower grade schools. I don't think they're really part of the SUTD anymore. That's already run by, by uh, you know, Singaporeans. So there's, there's an exit plan for this, no? So we are always reminded about this in Taiwan. Oh, uh, the Thai, the Malaysians, they, uh, now uh, the Cambodians, they come to our universities five to 10 years, okay na, they're ready. 
uh, they can uh, do it on their own because that's exactly what the Taiwanese did. They went to the United States, and then now they have National Taiwan University. They have all these great universities, which are sort of uh, world-class standards based in the US uh, system, and they are graduating their own top uh, graduates. So um, I'd like to emphasize here that if we are going to uh, pursue this, and I think we must, thing that we must address is intellectual property regimes especially now because uh, the world is moving towards this open innovation system. Because of climate change and other very urgent uh, matters that face us beyond our control, we have to work together. Universities collaborate, hospitals collaborate, uh, business and universities collaborate, academe. And uh, that's what you call the open innovation system. And so you have to just identify what is your IP position. Don't be too, uh, you know, um, uh, very, very um, possessive of your IP. This is what I learned from the Nash, National, uh, uh, the Nanyang Technological University president who attended the ADB uh, web, uh, workshop. And he said, in NTU, we, uh, we share. We do not really value our uh, IP this much. And why is that? Why does that work? Next slide, please. Um, so, okay, I think mabilis na, no? So, well, um, because uh, in many universities, uh, in Australia as well, uh, IP can be sold up front. It's bargained well, uh, but then, uh, then the university then gets a return on the investment from, uh, say, the Department of Science and Technology, and so they're given more uh, research money. So there's now uh, revenue, research revenue for the university. Okay, pero up front. Instead of uh, trying to hang on through royalties, then you're able to uh, sell uh, the innovation that needs a little more tweaking or a lot more tweaking before it's commercialized, right? So there's a lot more that needs to be done. So might as well, uh, the, the knowledge creators in the university move on and uh, embark on new projects and get new funding from the DOST. So this is our proposal, and that's the, the priorities, agriculture and fisheries technologies for food productivity and security, which is like the, uh, uh, the priority of the UP Los Baños. Renewable and nuclear energy technologies for clean, cheap, and continuous energy. And we need uh, collaborators for this. We learned this from Taiwan, from our Taiwan partners. Metallurgical and materials technologies for metal industries, stainless steel, iron, other metals. For energy, storage, batteries, and semiconductors, we need to develop our green metals, get the best value from nickel and cobalt, which we sell for a song to our uh, neighboring countries. For industrial machinery, additive manufacturing, 3D printing for replacement of machine parts, uh, robotics, automation for health and chemical industries, petrochemicals and, and organic chemicals. Okay, all of the above in the context of environmental stability, sustainability, and digital AI enabling automation technologies and other cross-cutting technologies. Bottom line, direct beneficiaries would be MSMEs and large industries. Next slide, please. So um, here we have how, how we think it might work. Unique features of the PATI cube, PATI cube we call it would be an attached unit of the DTI focused on serving industry, would be in a PESA zone centrally located in the fastest growing concentration of local and foreign industry locators and surrounded by several leading universities. This could be in the Calabar zone or it could be in the central Luzon zone. Enabling procurement and hiring terms, tax exemptions and export incentives under PESA and BOI. This is how we would try to solve our procurement problems up front initially. It doesn't mean that we will not continue to work on our various modes of procurement, especially for the R&D and innovation community. New intellectual property regimes supported by the IPOFIL. Getting a world-renowned Philippine expatriate scientist, engineer, and innovation management expert who will serve as an attractant uh, to uh, foreign-based Filipino scientists and foreign scientists. We should get the exodus of our expert scientists abroad, the diaspora going. They should come home to the Philippines for good. Recruit world-class Philippine expatriate and foreign scientists-led research teams, not individuals, in the priority areas identified. So the problem in the past is we're always recruiting them individually. But uh, actually, in UP Los Baños, in the past, there was already a model where we sent out uh, research 
uh, you know, groups of researchers, and then they came back as uh, groups as well. So it works that you need a research team. I, having been a wet lab researcher myself for many, many years. Dr. You, Concepcion, yes. with your permission, you, yes. you've, you've been speaking for 27 minutes. Yeah, uh, just three minutes um, more. And uh, do, do you have a view, do you have a stand on constitutional reform? Uh, yes, I think, uh, uh, Senator Angara, I think yes. uh, that uh, with this uh, kind of uh, ecosystem that I am describing to you, yes. I think that we should allow um, foreign researchers uh, to uh, be employed in the Philippines, uh, to have uh, foreign uh, PPPs, uh, FDIs, because we lack the experts in our country. Okay. See, So it's really a yeah. case of uh, you know uh, not having enough of uh, the mentors uh, yeah. for research and innovation. And this is really a fantastic paper, and, and I wish we yeah. called you during our Tatak Pinoy hearings because well, that was uh, all about creating an yes. ecosystem. So we, we, in yes, the oversight yes. of the law, I think uh, yeah. there, there's Absolutely. a lot to dialogue on, and uh, yeah. um, I'll let you wrap up. Um, yes, but I think what you need here is scalability, Dr. Uh, yeah. So I think um, what you need is, if you allow me to finish, yes. uh, I think uh, you need some scalability here, and because you know, the reality is you, we work in political cycles of three years. So I suggest you work on a three-year initial cycle where you can have uh, established results that you can show, and then that would justify uh, a higher budget in the next yes. cycle. That's just my, my modest suggestion. Please, please go ahead, Thank uh, you, Senator. Uh, so um, in the features here, I just uh, mentioned that uh, really, we really need to um, take care of everyone, uh, the private uh, higher education institutions, as well as the SUCs and, of course, UP. And so we would be offering joint master's and PhD degree programs with leading private and public universities in this center. Okay, and it's really modeled after the German uh, technological universities and research institutes, which is industry-centric. Next slide, please. So PPP is very important, including local and foreign PPPs. First of all, you know, UP partner, for example, with uh, the leading private universities, aside from the SUCs. Okay, so uh, when we have this person that I, you know, would like uh, to uh, serve as the magnet to lead P P P P Patti Cube, and uh, in the case of uh, uh, Picari, it was first conceptualized as a UP, uh, UC uh, partnership. But then we uh, made it more inclusive, so it was passed on to CHED. And the mirror institutes in UP uh, were vetoed by President Pinoy when he visited uh, UP uh, with uh, Chair Tati then. There are too many ERD buildings. But then the whole model just kind of collapsed because in those mirror institutes here, you see Berkeley uh, faculty and researchers would spend a little time, have their uh, full-time postdocs, and then uh, our faculty and researchers would opt in to do their research and generate new knowledge. So that was the model that was not really followed. That's why it's, uh, you may say, it's just a moderate uh, success. Okay, so uh, Dr. Puruganan did it properly uh, in NYU Abu Dhabi. So um, there's sort of like, you know, revenue sources uh, for sustainability, and that's like uh, the conceptual framework for uh, uh, Pati, Pati Cube, and you would create an innovation town, and then, um, uh, central to it would be social innovation and transformation, climate change, environmental sustainability, because this kind of innovation is not uh, uh, possessive about intellectual property. It really has uh, the community uh, uh, you know, ben benefit at heart. And uh, workforce education and training governance, edu education and engineering, heart of it. So uh, there's just a, like a model of how it would grow. And um, then the funding is there, and it would be augmented through PPPs and FDIs. And uh, there's a model that works in, a, in a, a Kaohsiung that the president, uh, UP president has visited, the Linhai Eco Industrial Park, where they share resources, so it's open innovation. And there are models of this in uh, uh, the universities in Taiwan. And this would have to be complemented by the massive postgraduate master's and PhD study abroad program. So out and in, coming out and in, and uh, then the PATIC 3 would provide, provide opportunities for employment for these. Uh, again, send them out as groups, then find a rational plan to make it uh, equitable and uh, inclusive through the regions, and pro uh, uh, provide attractive scholarship packages with incentives, with assurance of employment in university research institute, private industry upon return to the region, and uh, actually there's a proposal that industry could be uh, the uh, 
the provider of the scholarship and would sit in uh, the thesis of the student. So there would be choices, many categories of thesis and dissertation, say, in the university. Okay? So there's the budget. And let me just say that we're not picking this up out of the blue. The Indonesian LPDP scholarship program was begun, it was begun in 2011 to the tune of tens of billions of US dollars. Tens of billions of US dollars. I think you can move it to the next slide. And uh, the uh, priorities are the same as ours. So there are now 25,000 scholars of uh, Indonesia in uh, countries abroad, and they're starting to come home. But the funding there is with an endowment fund, but also it's to the tune of tens of billions of US dollars. So that ends my presentation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Angara, for allowing me to speak uh, for 30 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Noya. It's a really fantastic, uh, uh, very ambitious proposal, and I think there's a lot to expand on there, and hopefully we can continue that dialogue. Uh, Dr. Concepcion, thank you very much. Uh, now we'll go to, of course, we heard from UP, so I think we have to hear from Ateneo and La Salle as well. So we have the former dean of the Ateneo School. Uh, uh, sorry, we'd like to acknowledge the presence uh, of... Uh, um, Senator Tolentino, who, who used to be the chair of the Senate Committee on Science and Technology. Senator Tolentino, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, just, just a few minutes before uh, our resource persons would continue and before uh, you can have your lunch. I, I, was, I, I listened partly to the uh, dissertation made by Dr. Concepcion, but I, Mr. Chairman, I am now familiar, half familiar, not familiar, and perhaps this group would be familiar with a new concept that probably could take off from the existing PPP. I heard PPP, that's, that's, that's been for decades, the public-private partnership. It would seem, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just came from a, a trip with a group of local government officials. It would seem that the buzzword right now and it's not just a mantra, but the model right now is not PPP. They call it triple helix, triple helix. And if you're familiar with triple helix, it would, it would show us the intertwine between the government sector, industry, and knowledge institutions. And a good visual model for this would perhaps be Silicon Valley you'll be looking at San Jose State University, Santa Clara University, University of California, Berkeley, and Stanford University. So the dynamics would now involve the government partnering with industry, and as what Dr. Concepcion mentioned a while ago, the university producing the innovation serving as a startup hub, and perhaps producing the, the next members for the industry and the, and, and the government itself. So that's, that's a model I learned from, from the Netherlands, which uh, started Shell. Shell is about Helix. And Helix, if, if you can visualize this, Helix is a sort of an intertwined rope or nerve system. So I, my question here would probably be uh, on top of my mind, and I'm propounding this to, to the resource persons present. You can answer this as part of your presentation, or you can come back when, we, when, the, when the good chairman would have another uh, regional public hearing. How can, how can a triple helix formula serve the Philippines, and would it need a constitutional amendment? Would it need a constitutional amendment? Because we're now looking at the university. What if the university is involved in a program that is, is still restrictive? What if the university, for instance, is involved in a program somewhere in Palawan, or Puerto Princesa, we have a state university there, which would be uh, involved in production of uh, gas and oil, natural gas, among others. 
So that's that's my my little contribution, uh, Mr. Chairman, because we're talk, we're talking about uh, constitutional change in the education sector. How can how can the education sector, as part of that triple helix, propel a Philippine or lip? a Philippine economy to higher uh, bars. Siguro po, yun ang dapat natin masagot. Uh, I'm not propo proposing that, but you can, you can search what a triple helix uh, is all about. Uh, there, there, there might be more uh, better academic uh, definitions of this, but I, I would say that it would perhaps... Uh, emphasize the collaboration, interaction between the university, the industry, and the government, which is what the Philippines would need right now. And the chairman, as the chairman likewise of the Senate Committee on Youth and Sports, is knowledgeable that we have an abundant uh, pool of uh, youth leaders, students, who eventually will be part of the industry and the government as well. Yun lamang po, Mr. Chairman. Amaya ang bago ngayong umaga. Yeah, very, very. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Tolentino. Uh, yun, yun din po yung. Uh, I, I was hoping we would have more of those conversations going forward because I have no doubt that we produce the graduates. But yun lang. My worry is always where they will end up. And as uh, mentioned by some of our resource persons, if we don't have that ecosystem, then there will be that brain drain. Uh, you will, we will just be educating for migration. That's the reality. That's been the reality of our the past decades of our policy. That's why uh, I have also, uh, in our interactions in the EDCOM, we've raised that we must be talking about that ecosystem, not limiting ourselves to the educational policies we have, but also the industrial policies. Because otherwise, there is, they don't have that synergy that uh, Senator Tolentino was, uh, was mentioning. Uh, you, if, if, if one of those links is weak, then uh, there's, there'll be no sustainability. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Tolentino. Uh, so if we can hear from the... Uh, Ateneo School of Government, uh, we have Dr. Mendoza, former Dean, uh, Dr. Mendoza, who is uh, also an economist by profession. Uh, doc, uh, doc, Dr. Ron, are you online? Yes, I am. Yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you for waiting, uh, Dr. Ron. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, Chair Sani and, uh, and uh, our senators, uh, good morning, and also to our colleagues in the education sector. I apologize that I am not there physically, but uh, I trust... Uh, that the uh, discussions are going quite well and I've been following from here at home. I have prepared remarks, but uh, I thought it better to just um, start off with a few quick comments to draw on the insights already shared. Uh, you know, it, it has been such a rich exchange of ideas uh, this morning. So my um, series of comments, uh, I'll go ahead and, and share it. Number one, I thought to mention the context of what we're doing here, which is uh, basically where our country is compared to when our constitution was crafted. And I took a look at the uh, history and the statistics of our demographics, and I would just like to share with everyone that roughly 70% of our population was not even born yet when this constitution was crafted. And when it was crafted, the country was a different country then. The world was a different world then. Uh, and, and now we have um, obviously recently recovered from a pandemic, which has severely affected uh, our country, but also many other countries. But also we have begun to open up to a new world where there are geopolitical risks, uh, the uh, opportunities and challenges for fourth industrial revolution, and many other changes that will need to inform our development strategy. So I think that this is the, the bigger context. And uh, I believe that Sensani has a plan to sort of integrate this discussion on the education sector with the overall development planning agenda of the country based on the hearings that he is conducting. Um, so uh, just to point that out and to also remind our colleagues that our country is not exactly a pushover anymore. We are no longer considered the sick man of Asia, which we were in the, in the 70s and 80s when we had uh, the economic crisis back then. Our economy is set to hit $1 trillion mark uh, by uh, 2033, and we're set to hit upper middle income country mark by 2025. With, um, you know, if, if all goes well, we are set to reduce poverty to single digits, uh, you know, within the administration or maybe a few years after. 
So uh, it, it, we are we are a market also for some of these uh, direct investments, and it just struck me just listening to the discussion that there is on the one hand a very heavy state focus, uh, possibly because UP is well represented in the in the testimonies, but also we need uh, representation from the private sector, and it doesn't seem to be as confident as what I'm hearing from the uh, state focused uh, sort of interventions. So I think there's something there to unpack, Sensani. Uh, and certainly, uh, the, the discussion on opening up must accommodate both. And, and I think you're onto something there when you discuss this idea of using a very specific focus strategy on opening up and not necessarily looking at an opening up that immediately affects all sectors. So that's my first sharing. My second is, uh, I think we, we need to look at the education sector as one of the most important levers of our economic development plan. And uh, it cannot be looked at in isolation. It must be looked at uh, according to uh, Carol Mark and, and uh, President Gigi as an ecosystem, as part of a bigger plan with many moving parts and our education sector needs to deliver. And so I think uh, there, the, our development plan it can be very instructive and very useful in juxtaposing where our education sector is expected to deliver because our development plan has uh, a few big components, including what SecRC calls the certification of our manufacturing push. Now, it, this is part of our industrial policy strategy to leverage what we are uh, competitive in in order to um, you know, make our mark in manufacturing, even though we are very, very delayed in actually trying to make a push in this sector. As you know, there is Vietnam, there, there is Indonesia, there are many other uh, countries that have actually pushed on manufacturing well ahead of us. And if you look at the most recent literature, including by thought leaders like Danny Roderick uh, at the Kennedy School of Government, looking at industrial policy today, post-pandemic, um, they're saying that we cannot really look at low-cost manufacturing anymore in this new world. We're looking at tech-enhanced manufacturing. We're looking at automation. We're looking at the important role of AI and many other aspects which will put a heavy emphasis on services. And that's where the education sector clearly uh, contributes because it is in itself a service sector. And secondly, its output contributes to many other service uh, sector components that will be important in our manufacturing push and in our development plan. So that's my second point. Uh, the third point is, uh, I think, based on those who shared that they have reservations about uh, economic charter change, there is an interpretation that it will fix all, that it will cure all. I join Sansani in reminding our colleagues uh, that that is not how we should look at this discussion. It will leverage many other things that we need to do because there are many other parts in the industrial policy that need to be focused on many other legislation that needs to be passed in order for us to succeed uh, in this goal. And so I am reminded by uh, my industrial policy professor, Danny Rodrick, who said, you know, openness is not a development strategy. And that is certainly not what we're communicating here, that if we open up the sector, suddenly all things will fall into place. In fact, it will increase the number of things we need to do well, and the load on our institutions, and the load on our governance. So tama po yung mga comments nila Chair Tati at saka ang, uh, other uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Bautista, who shared their concerns about whether we will bring about more good out of this rather than more costs and more uh, social disruption. That is actually the reality of industrial policy and increased economic openness, that there are risks, but those risks, a nation needs to decide whether it takes them if it wants the bigger gains. So my question to our colleagues and maybe to our senators is, can we afford not to take this risk and basically remain closed while the rest of our region has actually decided to open up, integrate, and take those risks to actually latch onto the technology and know-how that we know will shape this decade of development. So yun po yung usapin ngayon. I think um, we are all concerned about the risks and if we focus on them and try to address them one by one, I think uh, we, we can probably do that too. 
But there is a bigger question. If we don't act, there is also a risk to that. We will be continuously left behind. That is a big risk. And finally, uh, let me share uh, the concerns of our, some of our colleagues. And uh, since I teach in the School of Government, um, read a little bit of my closing statement here, if you'll allow me, uh, Chair Sani. Several attempts have already been made by reformists in various post-EDSA administrations to advance economic charter change, to continue to expand the scope and ambition of our economic development. There is considerable evidence that loosening the restrictive economic provisions in the Constitution can form part of a broader agenda to boost foreign investments and create jobs for Filipinos so that many do not need to leave for greener pastures abroad. That reform agenda must include reforms to boost independent regulatory agencies and strengthen social protection for those that may be affected by openness. We must improve the inclusiveness of our market economy so that we don't fear economic openness and instead see this as a way to provide jobs for our youth and bring back home our millions of OFWs. It is also a key component of bolstering our national security since economic development always goes hand in hand with strong national defense. We will never be a secure country if we continue to be left behind uh, economically. Our biggest challenge then on each attempt is that deep distrust in our political system and our ability to conduct industrial policy fairly, transparently, and successfully. End of the day, if and when we open up to competition, our institutions and our governance need to level up also so that we don't end up on the losing side. We must overcome this in order to strengthen our chances to compete successfully. Thank you very much, Chair Sunny, for listening to these quick comments. And thank you to everyone. Well, thank you. Uh, very good, uh, very strong insight regarding uh, openness not being a strategy per se and it leading to actually needing more vigilance. I think that's very powerful insight. And thank you for a progressive and a hard-nosed, but yet hard-nosed stance. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Ron. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our majority leader, uh, who's the former head of, uh, of TESDA, which is a very important agency uh, in this discussion, uh, and uh, also a member of the EDCOM, aside from being the Senate Majority Leader. Good afternoon, uh, Majority Leader Senator Joel. If you, please, you're free to interject uh, at any point. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just like to uh, put on record my uh, sincerest thanks to uh, our chairperson, especially for uh, calling for this hearing. This is uh, very informative, educational, and uh, historic, I would say. Uh, we'd like to uh, give our regards to our uh, resource persons here. It's, uh, there, there's too many uh, personalities here that uh, we have worked with. And um, if I, if I uh, one by one, I acknowledge, Mr. Chairman, baka maubos yung time ko, but uh, we'll participate later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Familiar to you in EDCOM. You got a lot of familiar faces from the EDCOM. Um, next, uh, from DLSU, De La Salle University, we have the chairperson of the Committee on National Issues, Dr. Hasmin Liana, along with Mr. Ricky Kabugsa. You're both free to, to speak. And after that, just for uh, um, Dr. Serafica, Dr. Destura, Dr. Cuello, Attorney Castillo, Attorney Rosales, and Attorney Carpio. Thank you very much for waiting patiently. Uh, Dr. Liana, ma'am. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, the Honorable Senators and members of the community. Um, I came here on behalf of our president of De La Salle University, Brother Bernard Oka, FSC, and we are not ready with any position yet. The governing bodies of the university and uh, our Committee on National Issues and Concerns will be uh, discussing this issue, and um, we are going to submit a position paper. I would like to say, however, that I can say confidently, as chair of uh, the Committee on National Issues and Concerns of the university, that um, I can provide a short answer, and I'm confident that the university will go along this path. And that is the short answer of no, we don't need any constitutional change in order to address the education crisis. And we will hopefully be able to provide all of the um, 
supporting arguments for this position. Thank you very much. Dr. Liana. How about Mr. Kabugsa? No, no, no position there. Okay, we go to Dr. Serafica, President of the Center for Integrated STEM Education System. Thank Morning. you. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Serafica. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, uh, Honorable uh, Senator Senator Angara and Senator Joel and Senator Risa for uh, inviting us over. Actually, I'm also the president chairman of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. We have 700 members, strong international PhD level scientists and engineers. And but I'll take it down a level in a more personal because I do look at the actual request for us to provide our insights to the ongoing discussions about opening it up for foreign. I come from the United States. I spent 24 years of my schooling as well as being an entrepreneur for, 20, for 17 years, uh, managing a biotech medical device company. And actually, I look back, what allowed me to do that is a very strong university industry partnership. I based, went, uh, doctor, sorry, where are you based? I'm now based in the Philippines. I'm a Balik scientist. Uh, but for those 24 years, where were you based? I was in, in New US? York. I yeah. went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in uh, Troy, New York. And uh, I did uh, spend most of my time in the Northeast. Uh, and clearly, to me, the, the importance of opening it up uh, for foreign institutions with existing industrial partnerships is what I wanted to highlight to our uh, educators as well as our research persons uh, in the audience. Actually, after finishing up my PhD, I ended up starting a company. As I, uh, 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 Giselle mentioned, I did receive a small business innovative research grant that allowed me to raise venture capital and run my company for 17 years and having sold it to Johnson & Johnson eventually in two pieces. So I retired at 45. I came back as a Balik scientist actually in 2013 just to help the technology commercialization and intellectual property expansion in the Philippines. And I've been doing that with UP for the last 10 years. I've also helped LaSalle. I'm a member of the National Academy of Science and Engineering uh, and Technology here in the Philippines. I work with uh, Senator Padolina. But what's emerging with us, at least, I've been in the ecosystem of science and technology in the Philippines for the last 10 years. And I must speak that what uh, uh, Dr. Yi mentioned about the ecosystem. This is, we're building a cathedral here. We're all brick layers, but we're building a cathedral. And it'll take, I've been here for 10 years, and I've been trying to actually look at where the gaps are. And but uh, what do we have? Do we have uh, a turret? Do we have uh, um, I, I wish a, a I few could... pews? Or uh, <laughs> what do we have of the cathedral? Uh, uh, we do have the foundations, I must say. And actually, over the last 10 years that I've seen, 10 billion dollars, uh, 10 billion pesos uh, poured into R&D. I think we have a few posts and a few doors, but it's not yet complete. Our roof is not there yet, so we're not sheltering the rest of our people in doing that. And what I'm experiencing now, having been part of a League of Corporate Foundation for STEM education, I'm doing projects on social emotional learning for 21st century skills, as well as uh, technical vocational education with a USAID project for advanced manufacturing. There are gaps in almost every step of the way. And being able to welcome in foreign institutions that can plug in the gap, accelerate our adoption of best practices, as well as being able to partner with local industry. I was part of the USAID Stride project. I was senior, senior advisor of Stride 1 and 2 for nine years. It's a $38 million project. And I was focused on academic industry partnerships. We don't have enough industry partnerships. And how much more with international? We just finished our National Academy Technical Working Group last week. We were focused on globally linking R&D of the Philippines to the global ecosystem. And right now, one way of accelerating that indeed is opening it up for foreign institutions with existing industry partners. So I do support, I mean, uh, as a person, but definitely from the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, I'm sure uh, a great deal of our members is our foreign-based, about probably 200 of them, will be more than happy and willing to lend their support with their own institutions abroad to be linked to our ecosystem here in the Philippines. So I'm hoping it will be the beginning of many conversations on knowledge economies as well as how to make money with science. And I'm here uh, as a resource person for the Senate, I guess, uh, moving forward. Thank you. Uh, we need, we'll need you, sir. <laughs> we'll need you. Uh, thank you. And uh, just for the record, U.S. Aid Stride Project has resulted, has given birth to other programs like the DTI road mapping in uh, Region 7, 
um, in advanced technologies. So it's it's uh, that that project has been useful, and uh, we're trying to replicate it in various regions actually, uh, especially the rural uh, rural areas. So thank you, thank you, yeah. Dr. Serapica. Thank you, um, Dr. Destura, professor of the National Institute of Health uh, for UP Manila and deputy director of the. Strategic Initiatives and Emerging Programs of the NIH UP Manila. Dr. Destura, thank you for waiting patiently. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair, for having me here, Senator Villanueva, Senator Deveros, Senator Gatsalian. Um I think... Um, With your permission, I failed to acknowledge uh, our chairperson of uh, EDCOM and our basic education and, and ways and means chair. So he actually occupies a, a good, if we're talking about the ecosystem of education, uh, academia and industry. He's an important personality because he's on the economic and the education side, uh, Senator Wynne Gachillet. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, would you like to say anything before we go back? Uh, doctor, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm also coming in my comment on a personal, uh, as, a, as a scientist who came back. So um, I took bo I, I've seen the education component from both here in the Philippines and the perspective it actually has provided me when I was outside also learning from them. Uh, but of course, um, it's, it's not for everyone to uh, uh, say that you, you get educated and then you have to come back. Others prefer to stay over there for, for a various reason. And I had my own reason why I wanted to come back to the Philippines. But the, the point I'm driving at here is that globalization of education is really a, a huge leap for most of us because we are already, the world is shrinking. And what happens to us here affects what's out there, and what's happening out there obviously affects us here. So instead of trying to put walls into, to, into the institution of learning, maybe we can be more open to accept what's new and what is actually important to make our organization, our country grow. Of course, it's very important that in our mind we have to retain our culture, our identity as a country. But globalizing our idea doesn't mean losing ours. And the opportunities that we can actually expose ourselves to the knowledge. You know, I was a clinician when I came, when I left the country in infectious disease. I came back, I came back as a, a, a trained in biotechnology. So that's why um, uh, for the first time um, uh, through this journey, we created our first spin-off from the University of the Philippines. Uh, that created most of the local technologies that we are developing now. But what is uh, uh, 30 minutes in Singapore took me three years here. So, um, uh, but um, it's not a complaint. It's a realization of what's actually happening and why the struggles for the technology transfer is happening between industry and, acad and, and the academe. That particular link is the one that is very challenging because of what's, which, which are, because of our existing policies and rules. The question I have in my mind, because say, I'm not a, uh, a lawyer or an uh, expert in legalities, is are the current policies can actually be modified to accommodate all of these problems that we are facing right now? Or does it really require a change of the entire constitutional setup? Because if the policies can be actually be improved, without these major things to improve the things that we're advocating from the very beginning, then maybe we just have to improve on things rather than changing the entire household. So in my mind, um, uh, uh, I do believe that science and technology is a major contributor of the gross domestic product or the GDP of the country. And it's not a new idea. It's been proven over and over and over again. That's why there are more than 3,000 science and technology parks all over the world. And over 157,000 companies coming out on a yearly basis generating programs. When Singapore hit a certain level of their growth, they went to science and technology as a tool for economic growth, increasing their GDP from 1.8 to increasing an additional 3.4% of their GDPs coming entirely from biomedical sciences in the manufacturing division. A small corner and office can generate hundreds and millions based on intellectual property alone. You don't need an entire island or an entire continent to be able to generate those. And that's how powerful and borderless innovative ideas are. 
And for our Filipinos who are, I am so inspired by my young students, scientists. They are amazing, they're extremely talented, but they lack some tools, some exposure on best practices and what could have been. So these are just some of the areas that I could feel uh, would help us move things forward. Because I know that there are certain components in the ecosystem that are not covered in this, in this meeting, but are also <laughs> hopefully will run in parallel. Because the ecosystem, as advocated by uh, Senator Tolentino, the triple helix, now it's actually quinto helix of innovation. So the quinto helix of innovation involves government, academe, industry, um, community, and the environment. So when you put all of this together, you create, an, you create an ecosystem that doesn't only include the educational sector, but the four other components need to be addressed in parallel to address this very complex problem that we have. Unfortunately, we created ourselves. No? So, but. Um, but the best part is we can also disentangle some of those issues. And I'm very, despite of all of the challenges that the science uh, scientist sector is actually happening in the Philippines, I'm not giving up on whatever's happening right now. So the fact that we are ha we're having this discussion right now is something that will, will make it a little bit better when you wake up tomorrow morning. But my only hope and dream is that for the next generations of young scientists, let's just give them the environment that will inspire them to actually become better ones. So, so and, 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 and that's my uh, personal opinion about this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Desura. Well said. Uh, and hopefully we can have more conversations about the potentials for, since you mentioned Singapore, for health yeah. in the Philippines given the demand for a medical professional. So how do we, you know, how do you leverage that uh, going forward? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Joel Coelho, Professor of Agriculture Biosystems Engineering, University of Arizona, is with us online. Dr. Coelho, can you hear us, sir? Uh, yes, I can. Yes, uh, uh, can you hear me? Good, good afternoon. We can hear you uh, loud and clear, sir. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, good evening from uh, Arizona, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Senator Angara, and uh, to all the honorable senators. And, and colleagues, um, uh, and, and thank you for this privilege. So I'm gonna be quick, I'd like to make three points. And the first one is, I'd like to uh, make a statement that as you all know, the Philippines now has about 140 million uh, in terms of its population. And about roughly half of that, or 57 million, are actually uh, young people aged be between zero and 24 years old. Now, uh, they have the constitutionally guaranteed right to be educated. Um, and the government has the, uh, the, right, the obligation to, to honor that uh, constitutionally guaranteed right. Uh, but the fact of the matter is at this point in time, uh, providing a globally uh, competitive and world-class education to all of these uh, 57 million young people uh, it's just beyond the financial resources of the government yet. And so there is a need for uh, the Philippines uh, to, to reach out and to welcome global investment in education. So yes, I am in favor of the proposed uh, constitutional amendment pertaining to um, education reform. Um, the Philippines um, exists and it thrives in a global village environment. And that has always been the history of the Philippines, you know, from time immemorial, is that it's, it's always been a globally uh, uh, interactive country and that's how it's been thriving. Um, and so it's important to uh, take advantage of uh, what's available out there. Uh, to be able to meet again this uh, sacred rights, almost really, uh, to be uh, fulfilled by the government for its young people. Now, there have been a lot of concerns that I heard during this meeting, and those are really valid concerns, uh, you know, pertaining to the ownership, the, the administration of these foreign based uh, schools. But, you know, we're talking here about a constitutional provision, which is really the overarching law of the land. And uh, for that to be implemented or to take advantage of that provision, uh, it needs to be accompanied by, you know, another set of laws and regulations. And, and I believe that that really is a different forum. Uh, and, and that's where all of these concerns can be uh, 
taken into account and safeguards and guardrails can be put in place legally uh, so that, again, the interests of the Philippines in no, in no way uh, will be compromised. Uh, the last point I want to make is that um, opening to global investments for education in the Philippines really would help the Philippines and position it to have this steady pipeline of students who would major in science and technology uh, because the Philippines um, really needs to uh, establish and to build its science and technology innovation ecosystem. Um, and as uh, Senator um, Angara uh, re uh, referred to this earlier, uh, you know, the, the country should not be concerned just with educating young people, but also setting up this um, uh, science and technology innovation ecosystem so that these educated young people, Filipinos, uh, don't have to leave the country, but they can be gainfully and meaningfully employed uh, within the country. Um, and so... Um, so these two go hand in hand, and we at the uh, National Academy of Science and Technology, uh, Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, uh, we're all working together with the appropriate uh, government agencies. And in fact, uh, we're working together to uh, band them together so that there could be a cohesive partnership among them uh, so that this um, um, uh, comprehensive science and technology innovation ecosystem could really be set up and built uh, in the country and that it could be uh, made to thrive uh, so that all of these young people who are graduating from universities uh, can be, again, gainfully employed uh, locally in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Coelho, and uh, uh, good evening <laughs> in, in Arizona. Um, for the government agencies, now we have... Uh, um, the DepEd, Attorney Castillo. Yes, thank you for waiting, sir. Thank you. Makabata at magandang araw po. Um, in behalf of DepEd po, uh, we understand the significance of the resolution of both houses, number six, and the value of the DepEd's inputs on this matter. This is why po I'm here and I'm requesting the committee to extend extra time for us to finalize our position paper po. I'm sorry you had to wait so long to say that now. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, we have a PRC, the Philippine Regulation Commission, Attorney R.J. Rosales with Attorney Melissa Comafe. Oh, nga. Pasensya na po. I'm Mr. Chair and uh, Your Honors. I... We I have we have uh, the, uh, the lead uh, resource person, but uh, I just want to make a point. Uh, first... Uh, Yung pong ating pinaka-source ng income ng Philippines is the uh, services. And among them is the uh, our OFWs. So, in our challenge in our in PRC is that there is a... Uh, regarding international alignment. So, uh, pag uh, pumunta po sila ng ibang bansa, they need to study more. They need to... Uh, for example, uh, yung graduate ng nurses natin in other countries... They need to study another two years. So that's, that's uh, the main problem. So, and, and another thing is, in, in, for example, in Germany, you have to study yung language proficiency. In Japan, the same thing. And then uh, there, there are a lot of uh, machineries that need to be, to be learned. So by opening this uh, educational institution here in the Philippines, that would be an advantage for us. If they will be bringing the, their technologies, their uh, expertise, so this uh, group of professionals would be able to advance their learning. So once they go there, there will no longer be uh, barriers for uh, being employed immediately. So we must... Uh, um, ano po, ano yung ating pinakamalaking income ng source ng Philippines is the services, as I said. And among them is yung ating mga professionals. And that would be a best gift from them. If we will open up this educational institution here in the Philippines, and it will address this long, long, ano, long period of time of uh, addressing this problem. And another one is, uh, we say that uh, the, as a lawyer, ano, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and all laws must bow to its mandate. So if you are open, if you are making a legislation, and uh, it must be aligned with the Constitution. 
So with that statement, uh, I'll, I'll go uh, to our uh, lead resource uh, person, Director Kumapay. Thank yes, you. please. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney. Thank you for that, Attorney RJ, as well as uh, thank you for inviting the PRC to this uh, uh, public hearing today. Uh, I'll bet uh, that uh, with that statement made by Attorney RJ, uh, the PRC, of course, in, in this stance is uh, not the direct uh, regulator uh, as, as we know it. However, there is a derivative impact on our agency, uh, specifically as mentioned earlier by one of our resource speakers, uh, uh, the licenses that uh, our professionals take from the PRC. But also, please be informed that uh, the PRC, apart from, of course, the regulatory aspect of uh, licensing uh, and uh, giving examinations, the PRC also looks at developing our professionals. And uh, the PRC, through its, uh, uh, my office, the International Office, Office. We also collaborate uh, together with our other agencies, such as the Department of Migrant Workers as, and other uh, offices in charge in uh, finding these pathways for our professionals uh, once they are situated abroad. And uh, it was good that it was mentioned also by one of our research speakers a while ago that uh, from the, uh, not only are we looking from outbound, but also from inbound, because the alignment also of our curricula together with the curricula of uh, those uh, abroad is also something Thing that we look forward as a derivative impact of this uh, this uh, in, uh, endeavor that is proposed today. Um, together with that, we prepared an initial statement, but of course this is not uh, yet uh, the official um, submission of the PRC as we will be requesting that we later uh, provide you a more um, uh, what's this, holistic uh, uh, statement. But uh, initially, we would also like to recognize the intent of the frameworkers to optimize access to the best educational institutions to both Filipino and foreign children, as well as to ensure the best training to become globally competitive citizens in the modern world. Uh, the, uh, initially, the Commission fully supports the proposed amendments to, to the Constitution, uh, taking on from the statutory construction of expressio unius as exclusio ulterius. Mean, in, uh, we maintain that the express mention of one person, thing, or act of consequence excludes all other. And here, since uh, we have uh, specifically stated basic educational institutions will be covered, it limits, uh, it excludes all the others, uh, such as the tertiary education. Um, with that application, we would like a clarification, of course, uh, to what extent the law intends to, or uh, this proposal intends to grant such liberalization. We heard from the other resource speakers that uh, the 100% allowance would be is something that is uh, looked forward to. But is this the intention of uh, the uh, the senators who proposed such um, resolution? In the same manner, uh, apart from delving into these issues, we would like to. Uh, Propose, uh, we would like to uh, put out to the body that we will continue to address the effects of this liberalization from its standpoint that we have. And there is, um, in liberalization of educational institutions, there is an expectation from foreign investors to put up tertiary and technical vocational schools, as mentioned earlier, and that will operate in alignment with the requirements of the foreign institutes. In effect, this will immensely diminish barriers of trade and services as being uh, uh, propounded and will significantly aid the removal, if not the reduction, of what the attorney RJ was mentioning, the bridging programs for Filipino professionals who uh, are situated abroad. And furthermore, aside from the traditional educational institutions, specialized training centers, and even hospital facilities that cater to medical learners would potentially open up, uh, thereby enabling the advancement of training for specialized skills and sharing of advanced technology in the target field of specialization, which actually PRC is uh, endeavoring at the moment. And it must be noted that this is also in alignment with the goals of the Office of the Pref President to increase the number of practicing healthcare workers in the Philippines while providing human resources for health requirements of other countries. And that encourages also the exchange as uh, was, it was uh, propounded by Attorney Arjo earlier. And so over the years, the Commission has, uh, as mentioned, entered into various memoranda of understanding uh, memorandum of agreements, free trade agreements, as well as economic partnership agreements in relation to trade and services and recognition of professional services. However, uh, one of the most uh, profounded uh, issues that we saw are the um, what's this, overlapping issues of education, culture, and mentioned language differences. And this continues to persist. And uh, hopefully uh, through this endeavor, uh, this can also be addressed. And so uh, 
one more thing that we uh, did notice is that uh, the uh, what is the proposed uh, provision. Uh, uh, I, uh, albeit we 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 propound to the body whether it was an intentional deletion of the paragraph regarding no educational institution shall be established exclusively for aliens and no group of aliens shall comprise more than one third of the enrollment in any school, um, etc. Uh, this one uh, is somewhat. Uh, uh, contentious as it will also affect uh, some of our um, processes at the moment. Uh, for example, in uh, April 8, 2015, wherein the Commission has entered into joint administrative order uh, with the Department of Health uh, on the conduct of medical residency and fellowship training program for foreign medical professionals here in the Philippines uh, that entails foreign residency uh, residents of the medical profession who wish to study here in the Philippines. And in the said Zhao, the deleted provision we, was used as a basis of determining the limit of FMPs allowed in any medical institution. So uh, with this, uh, if such is a proposal to remove the pr uh, paragraph <laughs> mentioned, uh, this would be affecting um, some of our processes. In the same manner that, of course, we have to look into, as mentioned earlier, the Foreign Investment Act as well as the negative listing. So with that, uh, the initially propound that the Commission finds no vehement objection to the proposed amendments. Rather, it gives its full support to the proposed amendment to liberalize educational institutions. Thank you very much, uh, attorneys Rosales and Kamafe. We appreciate uh, the work you put in there. Just, just that in response, uh, I think the initial intention was to possibly open it up to 100% for tertiary and higher education. But I think, you know, along the way, we're thinking uh, one option is probably just to leave it uh, unless otherwise provided by law, which is the case for professions, the practice of profession. If there is a, a law which provides the country, then it can open, it can um, be allowed. So can we just give you a little bit of an, an assignment because it will help us very much in our work, is to, to you mentioned the medical uh, profession uh, regulations. What are the specific regulations dealing with different professions? Like for teaching, for instance, for professors, what, what, would, what is the current uh, restriction on them? Or do they have to get a, a licensure exam? Do, are they still subjected to the labor code provision that there is no uh, one qualified to teach that before they can, they can teach that, that specific subject? Because there's a, that's, that's what basketball coaches, for instance, <laughs> have to undergo in UP to hire, when they hire a foreign basketball coach. They have to show that no one can do that, uh, that job. So, so I'm wondering, for, for in the case of professors, uh, what, what is the uh, regulatory requirement for them? Yes, so uh, for, in, in general, no, for our professionals, uh, we, well, we, we adhere to the Constitution, again, that uh, the uh, professions, uh, I mean, uh, Filipinos are, um, it is, what's this? Uh, the practice of the profession is uh, uh, given to the, limited to the uh, to the Filipinos. However, uh, uh, subject to the provisions provided by law, and uh, that uh, uh, what's this? That allows the leeway for our professional regulatory laws to provide such uh, such conditions. And one of those conditions are uh, uh, the provision of reciprocity at the same time, the provision of uh, what kind of practice they are intending to uh, to uh, to do here in the Philippines. And uh, you mentioned specifically as to professors. And uh, the uh, we the PRC of course is um, limited to the regulated professions that we have in the Philippines. And right now we have 46 regulated prof uh, professions. And if such professor is under uh, the a specific uh, uh, regulated profession, then that is when the uh, the PRC uh, comes in. Um, if it's for example professors in the universities that would not fall under our, our professional teachers, for example, but that may fall under specific uh, categories like uh, a geography, uh, what's this, a ge geography, or uh, all the other related professions. Uh, I mean, all the other regulated professions, including engineers, for example. So it depends, of course, on their. Uh, but in general, they would under uh, if if. It is within our scope. We would require them to have a special temporary uh, permit uh, before they can undergo the alien employment permit from the Dole, as you were mentioning, that they have to, uh, what's this, uh, the, the requirement that uh, it has to be um, proven that there are no other Filipinos that may uh, practice uh, apart from them. So those are the conditions. But of course, it has to fall within the categories, as uh, I mentioned. And the, uh, the provision of taking the licensure exam as well is provided 
provided in some regulated regulated professions. So not all professions allow. How many regulated professions do we have now? Uh, 46 at the moment. 46. Uh, when you say regulated, there's a licensure exam. Is that yes, what it means? Yes, exactly. And, uh, and there is a professional regulatory board. There's a board that uh, sets further regulations on, on professional Together practice. Together with the commission. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Senator, yeah. Majority yeah. Leader. Yeah. Chairman, I, I was uh, listening attentively to uh, the present, uh, the statements made by our friends from PRC. And even Attorney RJ made mention about the importance of our service sector. Uh, I just uh, recall the uh, importance of the... Uh, ASEAN Quality Assurance Framework. I'm sure you are uh, all aware of this. And uh, let me uh, state for the record, the, the primary purpose of uh, ASEAN Quality Assurance uh, Framework is to enhance the quality of uh, education in the ASEAN uh, regions. And also, as you made mention, the importance also of supporting uh, the mobility of uh, whether you talk about students, workers, and uh, professionals, both within the uh, within and outside the uh, the region now if in in the uh, asean.org the, the the enhanced regional capacity in uh, higher education as part of lifelong learning provision including the harmonization of asean higher education moving the region into sharing the same academic standards ito yung uh, pinupush nila no? now there are ongoing initiatives uh, among ASEAN um, countries to enhance the quality education in the uh, ASEAN region by um, developing a quality uh, assurance framework in higher education where the ASEAN countries would be able or could, could benchmark and align their uh, quality assurance systems. My question is how, how, how will these initiatives improve the quality of education in the country. And as you uh, made your uh, uh, position, is amending Article 14 of the Constitution uh, premature, considering that we have not seen the impact of these uh, initiatives yet? Unless uh, we have already uh, assessed and say, kulang pa rin. And I think the best way to do it is to open up our education system. I would just like to hear from our friends from PRC. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Senator Villanueva, for that uh, propounded questions. Uh, the PRC, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is also a part of the uh, this initiative uh, the, uh, in the move for uh, our ASEAN Qualifications Re Reference Framework uh, under the Philippine Qualifications Framework Law. So uh, together with our interagencies, uh, that includes CHED, as well as DEPED, as well as TESTA, and DOLE, uh, we, are, uh, what's this, we are part of this initiative. Uh, this um, uh, the Philippine Qualifications Framework, um, uh, what's this uh, undertaking? And this, the, the same manner that uh, we, as mentioned a while ago, the uh, the aspect of specializations, the PRC is uh, is uh, looking towards developing these specializations to to uh, reflect it under the level of uh, six, seven, and eight uh, uh, under the Philippine Qualifications Framework. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, as your question will go. Um, if these initiatives uh, uh, what is improve the quality in the country, uh, we would uh, what is uh, answer in the affirmative because of course uh, as part of uh, my statement earlier, the uh, what is the, the the PRC is one in developing these professions and uh, by uh, creating these kinds of specializations to cater of course to towards this ASEAN qualifications re reference framework uh, together with our Philippine qualifications framework. This is one uh, endeavor that would allow us to uh, in a way. Um, look towards how to improve the, 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 our professionals and, the, and their and their endeavored uh, professions. And uh, whether uh, your la uh, latter question is whether the amendment of this Article 14 would would provide an impact or is it uh, too premature? Uh, I believe it, it can undergo parallel movements because uh, uh, together with what we are doing uh, uh, in in our specific jurisdictions, well, for the PRC it would be the practice of the professions that would mean after. 
after graduation and after licensure examinations, uh, developing these professionals through their specializations. Together with that, it would, of course, uh, the, 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 as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's um, more of an impact derivative for, for our agency uh, because uh, the opening up these institutions would allow this, uh, what's this common uh, what's this, uh, practice, um, international practice alignment as well as uh, uh, looking into international standardizations of uh, these impacts, which would equate with what we are currently doing under the PQF. Th thank you for that. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the Philippine Qualifications Framework because the former uh, Chad Commissioner is also here with us, uh, Secretary, former Secretary uh, Tati Likwanan, uh, former Commissioner of Ched, uh, Cynthia Bautista, who also helped this representation uh, craft, actually, the, uh, the law itself, uh, the Philippine Qualifications Framework. Now, if you look at the PQF uh, report, uh, let's, let's talk about, for example, level descriptors. Um, while the PQF has been accepted uh, as aligned to ASEAN Qualifications uh, Reference Framework or yung AQRF criteria, there's still so much room for improvement. For example, uh, let me point out what we uh, discussed in uh, EDCOM. I, I, I see our chairman here, Chairman Gachalia. In a study of qualifications of, uh, for example, warehousing and forklift operators, it was found that level two qualifications in the Philippines is only equivalent to level one in Thailand. Uh, now, according to World Bank, you, you look at our descriptors, the PQF descriptors, uh, they reported that our PQF descriptors do not progress uniformly across all levels. It noted that PQF levels do not fully reflect professional qualifications that require years of experience and practice and overlook hands-on experience and qualifications. Yan po yung nakalagay sa report nila. So, my, my, my question now is, where are we? Uh, what is the status now of the uh, review of our PQF level descriptors? As uh, noted by the World Bank in its review of the PQF. Um, I think it's important to note also the issues that have been identified in order to uh, um, align or better align and uh, reference our qualification frameworks with other countries. Otherwise, parang wala din po, no? Uh, yeah, so Father uh, Inocencio, please, sir. This <clears throat> had been thoroughly discussed during the past Higher Education Summit in Cebu. And uh, I think... Uh, we have really missed the recommendation of the World Bank study on the implementation of this PQF. And so there was really the need to, again, even review the, the, the bigger that represents our, our PQF. And uh, it's so laderized and one way of thinking and uh, not it's always referred to higher education, a framework of higher education. So this has been called to consideration. And since we are very focused on workforce development based on Philippine qualification framework, we said the disparity of the movement of TESDA and CHED has to really to be articulated and integrated. And therefore, there was a suggestion since there should be one mind in developing the workforce of development in the Philippines, why not merge TESDA and te CHED in one department? That is going to give a clear direction of both who will go to technical education, technical education or the academic professional field. So this was highly to be considered in this kind of reflection. So that's what was put at table during the summit. Because we see the non-alignment of the movement of TESDA and the non-alignment with CHED has caused this disparity of approach and the 
difficulty of really clarifying ourselves what are our qualification framework. And it not that must, let me say it need not be uh, unilateral, but it can be <laughs> as Australian circular movement in the development of the qualification. So this is a point to be really seriously studied. Thank, th thank you, thank you, Father. No? What, what I'm getting from you, sir, is that I don't know if I would say there's room for improvement. There's so, so much room, huge room for improvement. And it starts when Ched and Tesda uh, would meet. Exactly. Uh, Senator Angara, Senator Risa, and Senator Gachalian would... Uh, would attest to this the past six uh, or the last administration, I remember every now and then we would call for uh, Tesda, Ched, and Deb Ed to meet. In fact, the uh, PQF NCC only met like once a year, if I'm not mistaken. So how do we expect the uh, uh, level descriptors the review of PQF level descriptors to improve. Uh, it, 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 my, my, my only point, the only point I'm, I'm trying to, to, to emphasize here is that if there is so much room for improvement in aligning, in synchronizing the, uh, the works of this trifocalized education, especially the, uh, Ched and the, uh, uh, Tesda, then perhaps when you talk about internationalization and our goal to make our uh, workers globally competitive can be achieved just by, by uh, being effective uh, Tesda, having an effective test and effective uh, CHED. Would, would that be a correct statement, sir? What we were recommending is that DepEd should have its own proper scope of responsibility. The proper scope of responsibility of DepEd is that they ensure that all those who have finished basic education should have the foundation for tertiary education, be it TESDA or be it higher education. So once that is assured, I think we have basic uh, material to work on both area. And therefore, the mastery of basic competencies of literacy, numeracy, critical thinking, and all of these ones should be really very much embedded in basic education and should not let go of students who are not having that kind of quality both for tertiary and for TESDA, uh, for, for TESDA and CHED. So I think that is the basic mandate of basic education. No student should have gone to a tertiary education without that preparation, because we will build only from that competency, whether it be technical or academic. On, on that note, uh, Father, and uh, considering that we have Sec Tati here and uh, uh, Cynthia. <clears throat> Wait, let's talk about mutual recognition ag agreements. There are about eight currently, uh, Philippines has eight ASEAN mutual recognition agreements covering practitioners in nursing, dental, medical accountancy, surveying, architectural, engineering, and tourism services. So this means that the uh, qualifications of the uh, practitioners in this field should have the same qualifications as that of their ASEAN counterparts. So this is another means to make our workers more competitive among their peers in the region. So with this particular initiative, again, I'm trying to understand because uh, as legislators, we are always ultra-sensitive in uh, 
opening up, amending, or changing, or revising our Constitution. And uh, if there are ways to do that without opening it up, then uh, why, why are we going to, to do it? No? So perhaps my question is, are there positive gains from this uh, mutual recognition agreements um, covering these fields? Yes, uh, Ms. Incha? So, Mr. Chair, I think the mutual recognition agreements are there, but the, uh, they're not yet aligned with the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework. So work is still being done there. But I guess for the Philippine Qualifications Framework, there was um, the referencing committee that referenced to AQRF is actually has volunteered to also partly review it. So, so, it's, wala pa rin pala pala tayo so, so things are being done, mm -hmm. sir. Yeah, thank you. Sige po, Mr. Chair, I will. <laughs> uh, along the track of uh, Senator Joel, Majority Leader, um, since I want to take advantage of our experts and maybe even uh, the chairman, uh, on TechVoc, because that's, that's uh, the line of uh, former secretary, now Sa Majority Leader uh, Villanueva. Like, for, for example, in TechVoc, there is a great dearth of, of cybersecurity professionals. So when I was approached, actually there was someone who wanted to talk to me about providing cybersecurity for the Senate. I said, why don't you talk to TESDA? And then you can put it in, in, in as, a, as a module across because there's, each corporation will need a cybersecurity professional. Each uh, government institution will need a cybersecurity. So they, they went and talked, spoke to TESDA and they got accredited. So my, my, my question is, um, how does that, the, the issue of foreign ownership come into that? Because their partner was an Israeli. Because they, as, as everyone knows, the Israelis are some of the best at cybersecurity. So that, that's something I want to throw out to the body. Um, does, does the issue of uh, foreign ownership come into play? We, we'll, uh, uh, on, on, that's one example, no? but I, I assume across the board there are many industries where, uh, um, whether it's robotics or, or, or artificial intelligence, where foreign ownership becomes an issue. Uh, that's what I, I'm wondering. So maybe yeah. I think we need to, across the table are educators, but, but uh, maybe not, too, not enough industrialists. Uh, so maybe we'll have another session with the uh, entrepreneurs and industrials. Yes, Father, please. Yeah. Perhaps more than just speaking about ownership, what could be enhanced is how do we enhance partnership and collaborative work? And so therefore, this is the basis of how we are doing now our program with the different countries in terms of tech you know? So we have partner institutions abroad from China, from uh, Korea, and we try to see and compare our, our competencies. Do they match? And when it is accepted by the receiving country that our competencies match with the competency, so there is no problem. And what is very important to consider is the our ecosystem do not facilitate that kind of agreement between those contracting parties, the employing and the training party. So the problem is the sectors in the ecosystem that prevents that kind of facility to be able to do that partnership. So how do we now go into that kind of network wherein all this ecosystem can provide the facility by which the kind of agreement between contracting party and the training party will be able to supply the workforce. Dr. Serafika and then Dr. Concepcion afterwards. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would just want to address it with an example that we're doing now. We have a US aid grant together with Unilab Foundation uh, conducting advanced manufacturing uh, competency. We actually just developed a curriculum architecture for our advanced manufacturing sector. We did a survey for uh, about 500 companies last year, and we have 240 respondents. We actually visited Mayor Gachalian in, in Valenzuela as well to look at the facility that you can offer. Uh, but most of the ongoing discussion are around advanced manufacturing, the nine pillars of Industry 4.0, and we only have 15% of our companies in the in the Philippines right now practicing. And most of them are in cybersecurity, as you, uh, they have ambitions of doing lean manufacturing as well as uh, uh, supply chain management. But the more advanced pillars like advanced robotics, uh, augmented reality, even IoT, are not yet uh, being desired and administered. And when we talk to TESDA with DG Rose, as well uh, uh, doing STEM and TVET, 
we have to align with our partners in MIT in Boston with their practice of the Massachusetts uh, uh, make uh, uh, learnings that they had for mass bridge, bridging their workforce to become more adept with Industry 4.0. And clearly, the formation of a council is like I think what you're addressing, Father, uh, is what we're doing now. We formed the Advanced Manufacturing uh, Skills Council together with uh, MBC and uh, Tesla as being part of it, and SAPI, our current chief of party, is Dan Lachica. And by forming the council, it, it, I describe the project as an industry-led, industry-demanded, and industry-adapted curriculum. There's no education sector yet. And on the second and the third year, that's when we transfer whatever's being utilized by industry to be adopted by the higher educational and the vocational institutions. So it, it is like a piloting without... That's a much-needed missing link, sir. Yeah, so th that's another gap that we're trying to address in system right now as part of the curriculum development together with MIT in Boston. But again, the ownership didn't come into question. It's more of how do we roll it out and operationalize it. And then we deal with the regulatory agencies after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, yes. Dr. Concepcion. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned MIT because the... Uh, tagline of MIT is Mens et Manus, Mind and Hands. So uh, TESDA focuses on training, whether it's uh, machinery, instruments, etc. cetera. And that's, I think, where we can uh, demonstrate the triple helix of Senator Tolentino. The major investment is from the government. I'm uh, trying to follow, share with you the model in South Korea. So I visited a TESDA center there. And uh, the government invests in the machinery that uh, then uh, is used to train uh, the employees of uh, thriving companies, not just startups. And uh, the trainers are from the universities. So latest methods are um, shared by uh, the uh, university experts uh, with the uh, uh, latest concepts and principles. So it's, it's a very synergistic relationship and it's uh, viable because uh, the industry uh, employees are paying for their training. So um, that's uh, the South Korean model, it's called CHAMP. It's a major investment by uh, the, the government. And so some time back I asked Senator Cynthia Villar, why not uh, place um, TESDA under the DOST because DOST has the RDI, it has the uh, the facilities for training and I'm particularly uh, interested in manufacturing and uh, you know industrial uh, manufacturing because we need to develop our metal industries for example yeah, uh, steel manufacturing and fabrication okay, of course yung mga AI yung mga uh, you know uh, uh, virtual uh, robotics and uh, automation comes hand in hand with that, but the basics uh, should be provided by the government. And we have models for TechVoc, we have Don Bosco, we have Mapua University, so you could get experts from them, and of course we have our UP uh, engineering uh, faculty. So, sana magtulungan ang academe uh, government, uh, set up the facility, invest in it, and see uh, what uh, we can do to help our MSMEs in the food and agriculture and uh, no? business industries. Ayan, pe, pwede yung UP Los Baños facilities natin kung minsan underutilized. No? So there's another model, I think, in uh, Taiwan and the uh, President Ji Jil here, here has seen uh, the uh, eco-industrial parks that's focused on steel and steel fabrication. We have a proposal for them to set up uh, the uh, pilot uh, training facility in our future PESA SNT park in uh, UP Diliman. So that's one of our uh, proposals uh, with our NCPAG leaders, for them to set it up and to uh, have UP uh, faculty uh, train together with our um, friends from Taiwan. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Concepcion. Uh, we still have to hear from the, the Commission Can I region. just make a very, very yes, short yes, statement, uh, Mr. Chair? I think it's, it's, it's really important what we are hearing here today. Um, it's got to be industry-led. And I remember when we were in TESDA, and please don't uh, ask me to go back to TESDA, Mr. Chair, because you always say that. Uh, it's got to be industry-led. Otherwise, not, uh, the, the, the training regulations, the curriculums will not matter if it's no longer required by the industry. Uh, we also, just to report, we, we, we also pass, and the four of us here are authors of uh, Tulong Trabaho Law. And it's supposed 
to do what uh, Ma'am uh, Giselle uh, is talking about. Uh, we need to involve the industry. We need to involve uh, the, the, the big players to find out what they really need. And we have to accustom and if, need, if we need to custom fit the curriculum, the training regulation, we, we, we have to do it because uh, that's the only way for me. I, I, and I just want to put that on record, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Very much. Uh, yes, I agree. Um, Attorney, Laure uh, Attorney Carpio, sorry, Peter Lloyd Carpio from CHED. Uh, it's our last resource person. Thank, thank you for this uh, thank you opportunity. Um, the comments of our uh, esteemed resource persons and our legislat uh, legislators are 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 quite well are 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 well taken. So we'll submit the same to the to to our to our commission and bank so that we could submit our uh, written comments, Mr. Chair. That is Thank all. You. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney. Uh, yes, <laughs> were there raised hands aside from the giggles on this side? <laughs> uh, Chair, Chair Liguana. <laughs> I, I was just going to say before we decide the fate of TESDA, I wanted to go back to the topic of this hearing and just like a football say, because it was it was with Dole, it was kicked to DTI, and now it's <laughs> we want to kick it to the OST, so you know, right, they might. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Dole originally. But Go, you know, yeah. Mr. Chair, listening through to all of the inputs and the wonderful examples that were given, just um, points to, in my view, partnerships, transfer of technology, sharing technology, but nowhere does it prove to me that ownership is necessary. So that is the, what I'm still looking for. I agree with all of these wonderful innovations, but do we have to bring, do we have to own well, it? Well, perhaps then, then we have to again look at our question and premise. Maybe it's better just in legislation and then we leave it as is for now with the uh, colatilia that uh, future generations, at least at the very least, we made it easier for them to uh, pivot or to adjust. Yeah. Right? We made them more nimble in that sense because this is the first time in since 1987 that we've been discussing the economic amendments in, in, uh, in earnest or in detail, you know. So it took us this long because uh, the charter debate was poisoned by political and personal ambition. You know, that's the reality. So even now we're laboring under that bias because that's a historical bias. But let's, let's, just, let's just plow through, right? Let's just plow through and talk about the merits and what needs to be done. Let's let's let let's 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 uh, put away all the noise and try to find some uh, make some sense about all this. Yes, President uh, Gigi, yes. Yes. Uh, before the, uh, I think it's about to to conclude. But before that, uh, the presentation of <clears throat> Dr. Concepcion, uh, I can assure you, many of it will be aspects of it will be included in our next cycle, the UP budget. <laughs> They're all working for, uh, we are working with our scientist, uh, Dr. I, Sirapika. I anticipated that with my comments earlier, that, uh, <laughs> that she make it uh, scalable. <laughs> yes, yes, we are, we are making it scalable. Uh, um, we are very, very conscious of the need for industry, academe, and uh, government to really work together. As a matter of fact, uh, that is the triple helix. It's not actually new. I mean, Japan, is doing the same thing with it when it comes to producing their own COVID. As a matter of fact, Moderna is a product of academic industry and uh, government. Uh, and the director of Moderna is a graduate of the College of Medicine. Yes, uh, he's very happy to say that. Uh, he's, he's volunteering his services for UP as well because we are saying that our in connection with industry would be global connection. Um, and definitely, I have already asked... Uh, through, of course, representatives, and even uh, Secretary Pascual, a former president, and uh, RC Balisacan, uh, Secretary Balisacan, that UP is interested in hosting all those innovation hubs because we have, uh, I think, um, a sufficient critical mass of scientists and space, and we are very serious about bringing the work of, some of our laboratories into the market. What are you planning to do with the land holdings in Laguna? Is it Laguna and uh, Quezon? You have yes, the hundreds of hectares Laguna there. we have Laguna and we have the yeah. Quezon Laguna land grant. Uh, my instructions is to 
fully utilize these land grants uh, and uh, we are entering into private part, uh, public private parts discussions right now but basically it is used for among other things uh, climate change adaptation to put up a, a scientific uh, echo zone there we uh, are we are to, so, to collaborate with industry a, a kind of a microcosm of what uh, yes. dr conception is proposing yes we are planning yeah. some as a matter of fact we are thinking of a science city but focus on developing agriculture for, towards food self sufficiency and uh, also biodiversity. Perfect, because of the yes. the, the terrain. It, it, it rains a lot there, so you could... Uh, you could yes, you and could, we are also yeah. inviting uh, non-renewables per power because of uh, yeah. you, the University of the Philippines wants to be... We want to be the number one SDG university in the world. I mean, we, we won't settle for a second. Right, right, right. So, uh, and uh, thanks to the Senate for giving us initial budget for the SDG Center. Well, we we'll try to give you more for, <laughs> but, but yeah, but, but, but these but, are the things we, we were excited about, uh, President. Yeah. No? Yeah. But the thing about, uh, yes, uh, it's very, I, I mean, sometimes embarrassing to think that uh, our peers in ASEAN may not actually be our peers because we have only about 35%, around 35% PH, PhD, and uh, neighbors like Thailand would have 70 and approaching 100. And the problem with the university is that we produce such great professors, we, they are being poached. And so the focus now, I do not want to be known as the infrastructure president, I want to be known as the subcomponent faculty development president. We really need to invest on our human resources. And uh, <clears throat> that's what we did. The other thing, uh, Mr. Chair, is that we know that we want to produce as many research and scientists 35,000 is quite a tall order per million based on our population, but we're willing to kakasak po kami doon. Uh, except that hindi po... Where are we now? I'm curiously. If, if our goal is 35,000, where are we? Ang layo eh. Ang layo eh. 8,000. No, 28,000? No. Uh, per million? 20,000 no. uh, yeah. overall because it's 173 per million population. Per million ang pinag-usapan. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, where are we now? If it's 35,000 per million. 150, 170 lang yata, Mr. Chairman eh. <laughs> Malayo. <laughs> Per million, ha? Hindi yes, yes, per numbers. million. Okay, okay. Uh, but the, the one of the initiatives, I have expressed this vision already. We want to be not just a research hub for the country, but the research hub of hubs for the country. We want to, to be a, not just a university, but the university of universities in the country. What I'm saying is we don't even want to compete anywhere with undergrad education. I'm going to say something very controversial. I do not see the role of UP as to tap the bar, put the board, although that's part of it. If I had my way, Mr. Senate, Mr. Chairman, I would only admit undergrad with who are on our track, I mean PhD track, because our job is to produce more PhDs for other schools. It is well proven that the more PhD, a good undergrad requires PhDs. And to produce this, uh, say, 1,000 that we plan per million, you cannot do that alone. So that means really we are trying to encourage more candidates from other schools to take up graduate studies in UP. <laughs> the key is a very good postdoctoral program abroad for selected, uh, selected uh, technical or selected areas or discipline that we feel are important or strategically important for the country. Uh, as I said in the opening statement, we have 470 partnerships abroad and we are going to open it up to our friends, first SUCs, LUCs, and of course the, the private sector because our mandate is not for ourselves. It is to lead in higher education. And uh, definitely um, the program as expressed by uh, uh, former Vice President for Academic Affairs, Gisela Concepcion, and of course, <laughs> uh, uh, with, with apologies to Ateneo, I, I, don't, I know you, you said this is UP heavily represented here. Uh, we are, yes, that's true, but our mentality is that we are the national university and we, we carry the burden of the entire Philippine education in our burden, uh, as, uh, on our shoulders, in our minds at least. So we, we are sharing this university. We namin kaya lahat yon. And definitely, as a matter of fact, there are certain programs in other schools that are even more advanced than UP. And we say this uh, not with some, not with any kind of condescension, they are very good at that. So we feel that we should really be uh, there. But the vision is a university of universities. We want to produce, 
we want to be specifically a research university. And anyone familiar with changing university to that knows how no, how dangerous that is no? to, to, to plow through <laughs> set attitudes. But it is a challenge that uh, at least uh, this administration is willing to face. Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, I just advise you to select your audience when you say that, uh, <laughs> President Gigil, because as uh, Chairman Tati warned, when you say research, uh, nakakain ba yung research? That, those are actual quotes from uh, policymakers, kaya ingat lang po. But uh, it's a worthy ambition. Uh, and, po namin ang and we'll na support kayo. you. Nakaka nakakapakain. Dapat yung sagot doon, hindi lang nakakain, nap nakakapakain pa ang research, actually. Yun ang, yun ang magandang sagot doon. Um, uh, any, uh, if there are no other uh, from the body, I think I'll, we'll open it up to our colleagues, Senator Teresa, then Senator Wynn. Yeah. Salamat, Mr. Chair. At marami salamat kay President Jimenez for really quite a scintillating uh, input. Uh, I, I think it's rare na we witness uh, uh, the state university thinking aloud about itself, no? how to evolve, even speaking as an Athenian. <laughs> And before I go to my questions, Mr. Chair, para po sa CHED at para sa ating mga uh, associations of educational institutions, just two quick uh, points for the record. Um, first, Mr. Chair, I wish to manifest that the present formulation of RBH6 on education allows the liberalization even of basic education. As written, the word basic is inserted at the beginning of the provision, but the last sentence states, the control and administration of educational institutions shall be vested in citizens of the Philippines unless otherwise provided by law. So in this last sentence, which is controlling, there's no qualifier for education. Therefore, it is possible, at ito po yung sinasabi ko kaninang uh, prejudicial question or point, it is possible for Congress to interpret that all of education is open to uh, contrary legislation. And uh, next and uh, last for my two quick opening points, Mr. Chair, I wish to uh, remind our committee of the statements of uh, former Chief Justice Davide at the beginning of these hearings. Um, we, quote, with foreign control or dominance in our basic education, we would put asunder the noble, patriotic, and nationalistic virtues which are constitutionally mandated to be a part of the curricula of all educational institutions. These include teaching patriotism and nationalism, love of humanity, respect for human rights, appreciation for the roles of national heroes in the historical development of the country, the rights and duties of citizenship, and strengthening ethical, moral, and spiritual values. In the lib deliberations of the Constitutional Commission, Commissioner Gascon also explained that, quote, the intent when we speak of educational institutions being wholly owned by Filipinos is that in the rearing of Filipino citizens, Filipino values are encouraged. We have to safeguard the interests of our future generations by assuring that education be directed to serve Filipino interests, close quote. So to my questions now, Mr. Chair, to the Commission on Higher Education, both current and former. So aside from Attorney Carpio, to please, uh, as you wish to include uh, Dr. Tati and uh, Dr. Sinch. Um, uh, gaya po ng ibang bansa sa ASEAN, and we've had really great uh, uh, examples of them uh, in this hearing. Di po ba may programa ang CHED na tumutulong upang ang training at certified na qualifications ng ating mga graduates ay katumbas ng manghinahanap sa ibang bansa. At siyempre, maaari namang imbitahin at papasukin ang mga mahusay na guro upang palakasin ang ating mga course offerings. So, ano nga po ba ang kailangang gawin pa? Uh, kailangan bang alisin ang limitasyon sa saligang batas dahil may dayuhang universidad ang gustong magtayo ng branch sa Pilipinas na 100% owned nila? Would Attorney Carpio like to address this or would the, the former commissioners like to address this? I see, Mr. Chair, I see um, Commissioner Tati looking meaningfully at Commissioner Sinch. Yeah, any, would anyone, you like anyone, to uh, take the question? Anyone can uh, answer. Yeah, maybe Ched is the proper... Uh, would Attorney, you like to answer that? Uh, Attorney Carpio. Um, insofar as that is concerned, Madam, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we still haven't discussed the... Uh, so I'm not... At, Liberty to uh, ventilate the uh, the points of the points of chat on this matter. 
uh, how you pick up answer na lang yes na we will attorney. we will submit yeah. po oh, we, 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 we realize that maybe you want to think about it more yes, but uh, and not come we up with a knee jerk response but but please uh, for uh, our benefit and we'll do po Mr. Chair thank you thank you thank you Mr. Chair would the, yes would uh, so I, I like think I'd, we are really thinking very seriously of level 6, 7, 8 of the care and set up for higher education without prejudice to the revisions of the Philippine Qualifications Framework, that when we say it's level six, that the outcomes of level six are actually met by all of the institutions. I think this, this will translate to something as major, maybe, and controversial as K-12. to Because ASEAN, ASEAN, the ASEAN community is now moving towards um, a diploma stamp, a stamp of the level of the of the qualification now let's say we have engineering in the philippines the bs engineering program is offered all over because everyone wants to offer a bs even if we're not producing engineers but we're producing technologies or technicians so they should theoretically be level four or level five but everyone has a bs program what may be bloody i mean i'm just uh, off the record what may be bloody uh, and controversial and very political is that eventually you would have a regulatory body, whoever that is, that would say that this BS engineering program in this particular school is level four and not level six. So, but we are not yet there. But I think, I think the effort is so that we are closer, or at least uh, all of our institutions are closer to the level they are at. What that would also mean, EDCOM is now working on the typology of higher education institutions, which is so crucial, because some of our institutions, their mission is not really the mission of producing higher level, uh, higher education graduates, but their mission can be producing the technicians, and that's high, that's, the problem with test, with our concept kasi of test is level one and level two lang eh. Or we're just producing the manicures. But no, te 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 technical goes all the way. In fact, in Malaysia, technical goes all the way to level eight. And they have the industry uh, part, they have an industry dissertation advisor of, uh, of certain students. I think we need more success stories there, uh, yeah. Dr. Bautista, kasi nga yung mga magulang, talagang hindi pa rin na reverse yung bias. Eh. Whereas uh, the actual cases in, in real life experiences in yeah. foreign countries is that these tech book graduates actually make more money than the, than the BS graduate. So it's also the money that... And, and yeah. may, I, may I also interject just a very quick uh, a comment on this uh, uh, tech voca sector. Not, not, only, not only there is a uh, growing penchant still for diploma or college diploma, I would say, but, but TESTA should really step up because you look at the training regulations right now. The NC3s and NC4s are probably less than 25% of the total training regulations. Now, you look at NC5s, which is supposed to be the diploma level, the NC5s, it's zero. It's still zero. So, yes, I hope sir, we can... Sir, it, sir, it's also because of our education system is very American. If you go by the British system or the system of our ASEAN countries, nursing is a technical pro. It's not right. an academic program, but but right. in our case, everything is an academic program. But anyway, sir. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's we we have to kind of uh, no, reverse that bias, and and also in uh, I just want to share in in the Republic of Ireland, their equivalent of their their quality assurance framework, they place a monetary equivalent yes. as to the potential earnings. There's a range as what you can earn once you reach this. Uh, that is industry based actually. It's based on a survey of the. Uh, actual industry. So I think if, if we can come up with a rough equivalent of that, then, you know, th that's an incentive certainly for for families and, 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 and future graduates. Yeah. Uh, Chair, Chair Tati. But on the other hand, what we have is a salary scale that is based on a degree and which is really totally false. So you, you, you require a degree for a job that doesn't require a college degree. Because, of course, you know, there, there's more prestige. So it's, it's, a, it's a psychological... And, and then the, one of the challenge. promises when we passed K-12 to during your time and yes. it was that uh, we would cut the college degree to three years and uh, <laughs> among others, no? So 
and, and we, we would give jobs to the TechVo graduates, but unfortunately there was no accreditation. But we've addressed that in this, in this year's budget for the first time in a decade, would you believe? So um, these are the sort of things that, and that, that we have to address. But, but uh, did you get an answer to your question? Uh, well, actually, Mr. Chair, I, yes, I was starting to. <laughs> or, more, no, no, no. or more questions to your question. But that's the point, Mr. Chair. Notable nga na in talking just about this one question addressed to CHED, um, we didn't even have to mention or talk about 100% foreign ownership. Tapos, and daming moving parts talaga in our... Uh, ongoing efforts at education reforms. So maybe there's even virtue in um, uh, less um, tectonic shifts uh, on the ground of the Constitution and really just address these many moving parts with the tools we have already set up by law. So I'm, I'm, and I'm glad to, to have heard from the Chair earlier that possibly uh, the, the final version of RBH6, after all the hearings, of course, may be uh, to leave it at um, unless otherwise uh, provided by law. So I, I'm, I'm more hopeful uh, with that possibility. And I appreciate the uh, on continuing inputs of our resource persons to guide uh, the committee towards that, uh, the, the final formulation of, of the resolution. And then uh, still to, to the Ched family. Current and, and past, no? So, meron din po tayong Transnational Higher Education Act, also mentioned by some of our earlier resource persons, RA 114488, na pinasa nung nitong August 28, 2019 lamang. Ang polisiya ng batas to modernize the Philippine higher education sector and bring international quality standards and expertise into the country with a view to making higher education globally competitive, attracting a flow of talented students, faculty, and staff, and improving the country's human resource base. So, dito, pinapayagan na ang transnational higher education sa pamamagitan ng mga binanggit din na ating mga resource persons, academic uh, franchising, branch campuses, double degrees, at iba pa. So, in effect, meron na po tayong batas para ipatupad uh, ang polisiyang ito. So, Bakit po kakailanganin ang chacha? Uh, hindi ba ito sapat pa? Yes, Attorney Carpio? That is correct po, um, Mr. Chair. A, a foreign HEI may actually incorporate a Philippine company uh, with a 60% uh, share as long as it's approved po by the, by the SEC and then uh, foreign citizens may constitute up to 80% po of the faculty of the of the of the said school and 40% of the admin personnel may uh, may also constitute may also constitute po of the local branches so that, that is actually allowed po by the law by the said law With the of, uh, yes, Senator Lisa, has anyone taken advantage of that law yeah. uh, um, has anyone incorporated the uh, under uh, that law we will submit po a report po on the status and milestones of the of RE number one four four eight for the uh, RE 20, number one one four four eight. Ah, okay, it's fairly recent. Yeah, thank you. So we will submit po, Mr. Chair. And pending the submission of your report, Attorney Carpio, pero meron ba kayong kahit broad strokes na uh, sa pakiramdam natin, marami nang uh, ginamit yung batas na ito, or kaunti pa lang, or wala? If you could hazard an impression. Um, in the, in uh, in our draft report, point there are eleven Philippine HEIs uh, who had who had partnerships who, who had partnerships po with uh, nine UK HEIs po. Um, so yung po uh, initial po, and we also there are, there are, there are also some SUCs po who are, who was also partnered po with uh, UK schools. That is po. Uh, okay, salamat attorney. So kaunti pa lang. Yes, pa uh, based po dito sa numbers po. Yep. Opo. Baka, baka maiging i-maximize pa muna natin itong Republic Act bago subukang lalong i-maximize sa pamamagitan ng Constitution. Baka kung mas maliit na tool ay pwede na, pwede pang i-optimize. Hindi natin kailangan ng mas malaki or mas fundamental na tool. So kung, kung ganun po na we have this law that's starting to be used by foreign educational institutions, so napapaisip talaga ako kung... Ano pa bang gusto ng mga dayuhan na hindi kayang gawin ng batas na ito? Baka naman uh, tayo yung uh, mas concerned kesa sa kanila na we need uh, we need the uh, charter change 
baka naman meron ding pag-iisip sa kanila na sapat na sana in principle yung batas, but it's a matter of implementation and then of course the many other changes that uh, we see so, uh, in terms of education reform. At saka, attorney, would you know kung uh, meron bang clamor mula sa mga dayuhang eskwelahan na magmayari ng eskwelahan dito? In so far as my personal knowledge, maybe I will, I will just, alam po, direct po that to the proper office and then we will, uh, we will include that po in our, in our ano po, report po to this ano, committee. Mr. Chair, you, and, uh, yes, with Mr. the indulgence of my uh, colleague, I think these are very simple and basic questions that uh, is being raised by our colleague and the topic is to whether or not we open this up to foreign uh, ownership and I think it's just but proper for Chad to to have a a, a a position on this at least give us data I mean no nobody is interested uh, for franchising or putting up their branches here at least we have an idea sir if, if we can if we can give us something please um, Unfortunately, Mr. Chair, I've, I don't have, I do not possess the information at this moment. So I, I, I do apologize for that, Mr. Chair. But we will, we will, we will inform your office, po, immediately if if there's indeed a clamor for. Yeah, for Mr. Chair, we'll just submit the data, okay. please, okay. Attorney. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, yes, Doctor Gonzalez. I think, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the opposite uh, uh, exists uh, in Singapore. It's the Singapore government that invests in uh, the uh, foreign university. And uh, foreign universities are very, very popular all over the world, including uh, Saudi Arabia. So it's not a case of uh, the very, very uh, high uh, quality uh, foreign universities uh, wanting to um, invest here. It's the opposite. Um, we're the ones who quite need them. And so my question is, would uh, this uh, partnership, okay, not ownership, but partnership uh, be allowed for SUCs, for UP, or would it just be for private HEIs? See, I think that's, a, that's an important question. So in the case of NUS, uh, you know, Duke, that's a NUS investment. In the case of, uh, you know, MIT Smart, that's a Singaporean government investment. Anyway, the other thing I want but, to- But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they've decided to pull back a little bit because of the costs. Well, yeah. then, yes, and then there's like an exit plan. So after some time, then the Singaporean, uh, you know, university has to stand on its own. So the SUTD, uh, uh, Technology and Design, Singaporean University, is, is already producing its uh, engineers. There's another thing I wanted to uh, share. Uh, I think that um, we have to support MSMEs as a middle class, as well as our uh, startups, our innovators for new uh, new uh, solutions to problems. But there are existing MSMEs. And this is where I think the um, PRC, uh, the government, should make sure that we have good training, uh, uh, conceptual as well as manual, hands and mind. and. Uh, it's really the practice in Taiwan, in South Korea, and in Japan that uh, after your college uh, degree, you must really get through uh, you know, trainings to get certifications that uh, would allow you to uh, earn more. You be promoted in the company. So pataasan yan ng mga certifications. And that really relies on a very high quality training or certification of your skills no, for the next level. So that's something that the government must invest in, the training. Okay? So that supports your MSMEs. So in uh, South Korea, so I went to this CHAMP training, but it is in the Hyundai city, which is really the center of shipbuilding. So, siyempre, yung training nila doon eh, tungkol lahat sa, ano, uh, you know, building ships, heavy metal industries. But they invested in uh, heavy machinery. They could be, you know, second hand, but uh, they would still be used to train the, the employees of, uh, say, Hyundai City. So, uh, the other one, of course, is uh, innovation. So, that's where you would have our startups. But then, in the university, which is really the seed of innovation, we lack... Um, um, this is a thing that goes on over, all over the world. And this is foreign postdoc. So based on uh, you know, evolution and uh, my area, which is biological evolution, internationalism or high breeding is so important. 
So uh, everywhere in the U.S., you have universities where the research groups are run by the PI, and then you have the middle-level faculty, and then it's really the postdoctoral fellows that run the run the labs and uh, mentor the PhDs, the masters, the undergraduates, and even the high school students. And this is just uh, to emphasize that education and R&D innovation are inextricably linked because part of teaching and education is mentoring, a one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And so you cannot really dissociate the two. So uh, we're saying that for postdoctoral fellowships, which is practically nil in the university, in UP even, you know, we should be in this uh, scenario soon where we will allow, we will have enough interest from foreign uh, uh, postdocs to come. And in my, in my time before I retired, I had so many interests from Indian, Indian uh, scientists, young researchers who wanted to do a postdoc with me. But, you know, there's no opportunity to do that. So that's how the world works in terms of uh, research, development, and innovation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Concepcion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the points raised by Dr. Concepcion, uh, I will go there also, the yung implications po nitong resolution of both houses six, even on our state colleges and universities. Or maybe, Mr. Chair, just to go with the flow, diretsin ko na doon. So, related sa manner of acquisition and mergers of higher education institutions. So, sa current practices po on acquisition and mergers of HEIs, large corporations like uh, Ayala, Finma, SM Investments, and others have established their education arms to buy or bail out some local universities and colleges. So, yung isang tanong po kaugnay dyan, before I get to the the top of the food chain, the SUCs, kapag maipasa po itong uh, RBH6, ang mga foreign-owned and controlled corporations, will they be allowed to buy or bail out local universities and colleges? O sila'y maging master franchisers ng mga eskwelahan sa bansa? Would uh, Chad Current or Previous like to um, address the question? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I see uh, Dr. Tati. That would be my interpretation, that basically that, what, that is what ownership would allow them to do. But to, maybe to go back to a previous question, Senator Risa, um, yes, even before the transnationalization law, uh, because that came after my time, but even when, during our time, the uh, the Picaring precisely and uh, internationalization programs were not, did not bear their full fruit. In other words, with the existing structures, we did not even develop its full potential. So what are we, why are we talking ownership? And I, I don't get a sense that there is, you ask, are there a lot of foreign universities knocking at our doors? I doubt it, you know. So this is like a theoretical question. That's why my original point, is it worth the, our time discussing all of this? Because there's so many ideas around the room that we can develop outside of the rubric of ownership. You know? So why are we discussing ownership? Thank you, Dr. Tat. Yes, uh, Dr. Sinch, Mr. Chair, and then I think Mr. Chair Father Delvo. So, so I think I'll pick up from, I mean, just looking at, at Singapore, they invite for strategic reasons. We have to determine what the strategic reasons are. And whatever arrangement, whatever incentives, whatever, I'm, I'm not sure they would like ownership, but even if they want ownership, it has to be very strategic. For instance, you can invite, okay, maybe Duke, I'll just use Duke's University. One possible strategic thing is you, have, you need to have a lot of PhDs. Uh, Dr. Gisela has been mentioning that. And you, we send them out, and it's, it's very, sometimes it's very costly. Can't we get Duke University here for this particular period of time? offer programs so that our faculty can get it from Duke University, but in the Philippines. I mean, I'm just using Duke as an example. Or strategically, if it's R&D, can't we, can't we get, it's like a Picari thing, the University of California, that was the whole idea. So it's strategic, it's very selective, and it's the government that chooses. 
Now, whether you, and then they will not ask for ownership, or if they ask for ownership, then you can perhaps for a certain period of time. I mean, and, but, but those are case to case, di ba? Ang, ang problem lang, that will happen, yung the mergers, the foreigners. If it's an open market, the way we have our open market in education, if that's the case, then that will, and that's what you don't like to happen because that is what will further erode our reputation as, as an education provider in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Interesting, these discussions natin, we get to reflect also on previous policy directions we have set, like the privatization of education. Mr. Chair, I think Father Delvo wants to yes. interject. Father, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of Cocopayan Catholic Education Association of the Philippines, I can prudently say na introducing reform or amendments to the sections concerned may not be the may may be done much much later. That's not the urgent concern right now. Because why? One, we have not made. Uh, the departments of the government like CHED, like basic education, DepEd, like TESDA, like DOST, DOST, to work together actively and sovereignly in a harmonized, coordinated manner. Wala pa dun eh. Second, we have been talking about employability of our graduates, but we have not been really serious into enabling our graduates to be producers makers, uh, manufacturers, and shapers. Otherwise, we become just retailer and catering to hospitality services. We don't uh, grow out of this only, you know. We, only, we have to be producers and makers. And another one would be, we rather improve policy and implementation, and the government seems to be very highly and over-regulating in regards to private education institutions. And finally, if LUCs or SUCs are allowed to partner with foreign entities because they have the land to offer, and which we do not have, that might also create another problem for us in terms of sustainability and likewise uh, flourishing. We cannot develop our private education institutions, when in fact, we are rendering service in complementary to the government service. Salamat, Father. Uh, Mr. Chair, actually, na-anticipate ni Father yung susunod kong tanong sa CHED. Thank you for opening it up, Father. Kasi tatanong ko sana kung posible din ba, uh, upon the decision of the Board of Trustees ng ating mga SUCs or LUCs, na ibenta yung kanilang mga pamantasan at kolehiyo sa isang foreign private education provider in the guise of internationalization and modernization of HEIs. Would Attorney Carpio have any uh, soundings from from Chad um, about this? Mr. Chair, um, since the since the SOCs are governed by their charters, no, we should look into the powers and functions of the of of the of the boards of the of the SOCs. Um, if they are expressly allowed to do that, uh, they could do so. But if there's no express power in the in the charter, I mean, they they they, they uh, it will be not allowed by it, it's not legally um, possible po to do so. Po. Salamat, Attorney. And maybe, bukod sa aming mga miyembro ng komite, baka pati yung mga suks at looks would be anticipating yung position paper ng CHED dahil kayo somehow would create that um, moral suasion possibly about how they might look at uh, this kind of a scenario kung maipasa yung RBH6, at least in its present form. Kasi ang susunod na iwa-wonder ko, eh, so pwede ba na yung UP O yung PUP, o kahit sino sa mga pinahalaga nating SUCs in the future ay pag may arian ng foreign entities. Hindi ko ma-imagine talaga yun. Natawa si, ano, si President Jimenez. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, um, nakasulat malaki palaging banner sa Quezon Hall, nilarali ka ako araw-araw eh. Servicio, hindi but under negosyo. the UP Charter, you're not allowed to sell land. No, you're, not, you yeah, you're not allowed. Servicio, hindi negosyo. Uh, so, anyway, uh, 
kahit sa mga entrepreneur students namin, sumisigaw na rin servisyo, hindi negosyo. So, hindi ko nga maintindihan how they, how they translate that into their careers when they become businessmen. But anyway, uh, but at any rate, uh, yes, uh, we are a government entity. Our government is a board. We are a public institution. As a UP, in my opinion, cannot sell. No? We are not even allowed to sell to alienate property, pa property, property natin, uh, real estate, even to another government agency. No? Uh, unless, of course, it's by act of Congress. So we have land grants. And it's not really, uh, I, I would say, within the commerce of men. It is a public institution. And to be frank, it is unthinkable. I have never thought even of it. <laughs> so, so we will remain a public institution. But we can enter into... <clears throat> We have the corporate powers since my land grant. We're supposed to actually, we are a land grant university. And we're supposed to really use our resources to enhance. And I intend to do that uh, to improve the university experience, to, in specifically to produce more of our PhDs, to retain them, and to, to, as, uh, to invest as well in 21st century pedagogy because uh, we are moving from 19th century to the new <laughs> mode in, in a... We in UP believe that our civilization has, in fact, already changed, and we are now living in a digital civilization, and that is a completely new way of living. It's a new kind of homo sapiens that lives in a digital civilization. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I hope, President Jimenez, as you develop the 21st century, Churi pedagogy, you will retain some of the oldies but goodies like the pedagogy of the oppressed of Paulo Freire, Freire and such yes, others. Yes. Uh, it's my readings <laughs> in, in, uh, in college. Opo. Yes. Sal Salamat, uh, Mr. President, mm. Mr. Chair. Do I have time for more questions in this round, Mr. Chair, or should I wait till the uh, next round? You can ask one more. One more uh, question, after, yeah. Mr. Chair. Salamat po. Okay. Um, uh, as you see, okay. Uh, my last question for this round on state subsidies for higher education. Uh, kung maipasa yung RBH-6 uh, in its current form, anong implikasyon nito sa kasalukuyang pondo at subsidyong binibigay ng Estado sa mga public HEIs, SUCs, at maging mga LUCs? Pati ba yung mga dayuhan makatatanggap na sa Estado natin? Chad, uh, um, I don't think so, ma'am. It will have. It, they will be allowed po to 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 allow po. I they, they will be allowed to receive any government ano po, subsidies. Yes, I, po. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess we'll wait for the position yes, paper po. of Chad. Because the impression ko naman, we've been talking about uh, education as uh, more in the services sector, at least of the economy. Although education is more than the economy, because my existing trade principles in. Uh, trades in services, gaya ng liberalization of higher education, baka lumabas na may free pass ang ating gobyerno na umatras sa responsibilidad nitong pondohan ang mga suks at looks at hayaan silang makipag-compete sa free market ng higher education. And a few of our resource persons earlier mentioned this, Mr. Chair, and I share their apprehension and the desire that the state not abdicate, abdicate in its uh, obligation, not uh, use uh, the, uh, the, the resolution or any other instrument as an excuse, uh, you know, pako-opt, so hindi na, niya, hindi na niya tungkulin sa ating, sa ating mga estudyante o, o sa ating bayan. Uh, and lastly, very quick lang uh, related question, Mr. Chair. Dito pa rin sa state subsidies for higher education. Posible ba na sa ilalim ng RA 10931, yung UACTE Act, na ang mga foreign-owned and controlled HEIs ay maging eligible sa tertiary education subsidies? I don't think so, ma'am. And again, I hope you are right, yes, uh, Ched. We will eagerly await your position paper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Marami salamat. Marami salamat, Mr. Chair. Um, that's from me. Interesting from, questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Issa. Senator Wynn, yes, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Chairman. Sorry, sorry, Senator Wynn. See, uh, Majority Leader has two minutes left. Can I? Can I? <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, can we just finish him? Then we'll go to you. My I apologies. Just, My I apologies. Have, I should have said it at the outset. My sorry, apologies. Sorry, uh, Mr. Yeah, Chair. I just have two, uh, two, three points I'd like to raise. One, looking at the. Uh, 
implementation of uh, uh, the uh, Transnational Higher Education Act. Uh, there is a report here from uh, CHED that out of 108 TNHE program applications, out of 108, only two applications were approved. One in Houston, one from Houston, yung isa from Korea. I, uh, I will, I, 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 I am more than willing to be corrected if that is uh, a wrong information, uh, Attorney uh, Carpio. Um, number two, I'd like to point out in the EDCOM Year 1 report, and I'm sure uh, our chairman, Chairman uh, Gachalian and Commissioner uh, Angara are very much aware of this. Two of the identified priority areas in improving higher education in the country are one, access to quality education, and two, quality assurance. Um, pag tinignan po natin itong, uh, and I wanted to show you a slide based on the 2022 report of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, nakalagay po dito, yung Philippines has the most number of public HEIs, most number po yan, second most number of private HEIs, among ASEAN member states in 2020, in 2015, 2017. However, the challenge to improve quality remains as the number, as the number of autonomous higher education institutions, centers of excellence, and centers of development continue to remain very low. Um, so the question is, what forms of support ang uh, are being extended uh, to our present schools in order to improve the quality of our existing uh, institutions. Another question that I'd like to raise, and I, let me show this uh, slide because uh, I don't have much time. Um, ito po, uli, ASEAN uh, Quality Assurance uh, Framework. No? Tignan natin. Pag tinignan po natin yan, yung Center of Excellence and Center of Development, makikita natin napaka-konti. At uh, yung Center of Excellence naka-focus sa NCR. So, I hope we'll do something about it. And I'm not sure if opening up ownership in the uh, higher education institutions would address this problem. Convince us. Um, another thing that I'd like to raise, and I'll end up here, uh, Mr. Chairman, you look at uh, Article 14, Section 4, Number 2 of the 87 Constitution, inaalaw po yung foreign ownership of educational institutions if they are established by religious groups and mission boards, established for foreign diplomatic personnel and their dependents and or for foreign temporary residence. Foreign enrollment in such schools is capped at 33% of total enrollment. Now, you look at this uh, uh, education index. Ito po ay uh, measured by adult literacy rate with uh, two-thirds weighting and the combined uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary gross enrollment ratio with one-third weighting. And uh, Please take note, yung according to EDCOM, yung Vietnam po dyan, nandyan, yung Vietnam and Cambodia allows 100% maximum foreign investment share. But still, if you look at this uh, data, it falls lower than Philippines in education index. So again, yung tanong po dito is, what would be the impact of allowing foreign-owned schools to the overall education quality in the Philippines? And how can the lifting of the foreign uh, ownership limitation contribute to the overall improvement of the quality of Philippine education? And then I, I go back to the report ng uh, EDCOM uh, year-end report. Ang dalawang identified priority areas is not just access to quality education, but quality assurance. So I hope 
uh, you wanted to, yes, uh, Director Sincha. I think um, back to the selectivity thing. If if we're selecting institutions that they would have quality for specific things. So for instance, quality for R&D, quality for creating the innovation network, but that's one. But for the COE, COD's tangential, in other words, it doesn't have any impact. What we need to do is actually, that's why, we're, that's why the quality assurance for higher ed and edcom is really making sure we really have a fit typology. Because the reasons why the reason why you have very few COEs and CODs, COEs and CODs are for research universities. Eh? But most of your institutions are not research universities, but some of them may be excellent in what they are doing. But but then they do not get incentives. Only the research universities get incentives because our metrics are connected to research universities. Until maybe 2010. Everybody had to do research. Everybody had to have a research office. So you had a lot of cheating. Uh, you have little schools saying they have a research director, but they're not, they don't really have one. So if, that, if we're able to do that horizontally, then you can actually have more COEs and CODs, but for different types of institutions. And maybe some institutions may be out of the higher education sector, Maybe because their mission, and they might recognize it, their mission is really producing the level five, the level, the, the technologies rather than the engineers, I'm using engineering. So that's for the quality. In that case, I don't think, I don't think coming in of foreign institutions will have any effect uh, unle unless you come, you have an open market and they come in and that effect is going to be negative because they will add to the lower quality of, of Philippine education. Thank you. Thank you. If Chad would like to uh, comment on these uh, issues um, that we raised, sir. Yes, po, ano, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we will just we we take note po of the of, of the concerns po of the of the good senator po, and we will uh, include them pin po in our ano po, in our official comments po. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's that's all. Thank I, you very I, much, I, Majority I, Leader. Uh, before you. I acknowledge uh, or before I recognize. Senator George, I want to acknowledge Dr. Doy Santos, who was with us last week during the public utilities hearing. So we'll give the floor to Senator Wynne Gachalian for his thank questions. You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, this is a hearing on uh, the proposed amendments to certain economic provisions of our Constitution. And um, part of the economic provision is education. No? So, so meaning that uh, the legislature is looking at education uh, as a means to drive our economy. And hopefully, uh, by liberalizing education, we can attract hard investments, foreign direct investments. So there are two schools of thought, Mr. Chairman. Number one is really, really attract foreign direct investments. Number two, by attracting uh, foreign institutions, we will attract um, uh, different institutions with um, strong capability, for example, in research, in, in other, in other um, areas, in higher education, or even basic education. And uh, hopefully develop our, hopefully they come here and they become a mechanism to develop human capital in our country. That will drive our econo economy in the long run. So one is hard investments in the short run. One is human capital to drive our economy in the long run. So my, my question, Mr. Chairman, to our resource persons, and um, I, I'm not really sure if they will have this answer, is that short-term goal, will opening up ownership to, um, to foreign investors in education, will we attract FDIs, foreign direct investments, in the education sector? I'll give an example, Mr. Chairman, when we were discussing um, the Public Services Act, and when we carved out airlines, you know, we removed airlines as public utility and designated it as public services, is because foreign investors, uh, especially the big airlines, would want to own 100% uh, of that airline to bring in their capital for, for obvious reasons. They want to manage the airline. You know? So in the same, the same vein, in the same example, will, will allowing foreign 
100% foreign ownership in education institution drive in foreign investments to our country. And I want to open that up to any of our resource persons. Uh, yeah. Dr. Serafika then, Dr. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Kachalian. Definitely, that's what I'm positioning myself actually being in the middle of academia and industry. That in my experience in the United States, because of the partnership of my university with industry, I was able to train and eventually become an entrepreneur after finishing my doctorate and eventually creating economic viability by raising venture capital for 17 years and employing several PhDs and masters. So that's a kind of economic activity, but it has to be very directed. If I'm UP, I'll take the case of UP, we'll take advantage of our health research. We are already doing that type of collaboration with clinical trials on some of our activities. How about you put your entrepreneur hat on? Uh, yes. What, what, would, uh, what would make sense from that point of view? I think that's yeah. the question of yeah, uh, it, it's Senator Wynn. What yeah. foreign universities would want from us is one, our markets, our population, two, potential applications of their either new or even mature technologies. Three is the secondary only, the traditional, but really to harvest intellectual capital that they can then ship back or use. I mean, there's no really borders now in terms of being able to collaborate. We can zoom, we can uh, calculate whatever equations we wanted to do in, the, in that collaboration, and it can be fed back to the mothership, and it's a collective. So in that sense, by, 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 by having this open collaboration, but very directed, very targeted. I mean, I, I, I use it in, in UP. Uh, I say I only help AHEM, agricultural, health, energy, environment, education, and advanced materi materials. All on that deep research that I wanted to commercialize, those technologies so that UP ka una ka sa pakinabang. That's what I always tell my Tampung taon na kami sa UP, dalawa yung boss ko dito, si Sinjo tsaka si, si Giselle. But definitely, it's all directed towards technology commercialization and utilization for the benefit of the Filipinos. We spent a total of 10 billion, I've seen 10 billion, poured into research in the last 10 years that I've been back. I was in the U.S. for 24 years. The 10 years that I hear, I saw Picari. I was being recruited for the health executive director for Picari as well. I, I'm now advising them on the lakas. I'm a member of the National Academy. I'm looking at all our research in the National Academy as well. And all of it is towards an economic value creation. That's what we do as entrepreneurs. We need to create value. And does this opening it up create value? Or how can it create value is the question that I was thinking. And that the only way it can create value is if I welcome the right specialized university. It can be Max Plan it can be uh, specialized Sor Sorbonne, or it can be uh, MIT, or I'm collaborating with MIT right now on advanced manufacturing. Or it can be Stanford. I was in Berkeley last summer as well. But very directed towards a particular uh, Industries or industry or sector. Endeavors, yeah. That will bring in... What about seafarers? Because uh, you see a lot of foreign companies yeah. uh, I, putting I, up schools for seafarers. I had uh, some... Yeah. My venture capitalists were from Holland. And I know Rotterdam and as well as uh, Sweden has very strong in a AI and, and, and data science on seafaring and where to fish. Yeah. But those kinds of very directed, almost invitation or recruitment, for lack of a better word. We need to be very selective in recruiting these foreign universities with our intent in mind. The way China did it with their fast train. They recruited TGV and IBT of, of Germany. But how can we be strategic? We can't even regulate properly. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully, yeah, science, just, I think that's the point that uh, Dr. Cynthia was too polite to say outright, but that's really what she was adverting to. And she said, taking into account our regulatory regimes, diba? may regulatory weaknesses. Talaga, so. Oh, definitely. In medical so. devices, which I'm from, I, I had a, uh, invented something to patch your brain after a tumor section. That was my product in the United States that we eventually sold to Johnson Johnson. It's yeah, but, but, uh, so not possible maybe, here. With maybe, doc, Dr. Serafik, what, what's productive is, if you, in, in, with, with your permission, Senwin, yeah. is, is you point out worldwide, because of your, your, your dual hat as a professional, as a scientist, and as an entrepreneur, uh, where do you see the world turning to? Because obviously there's a lack of health professionals. Yes. There's a lack of cybersecurity professionals. There's a lack of uh, seafarers to man uh, the ocean-going vessels of the world. Ano pa ba? Ano pa ba yung uh, So that's, that helps us become more strategic since the, the idea around the table is to be more strategic in our interventions. In, in, from your standpoint, saan po tayo may pag-asa? 
Unang-una po sa system po ang aming focus is on 21st century skills, which is now three from. It has to be cognitive, it has to be social emotional and it has to be technical. Without those three legs, you cannot stand a 21st century student. Hindi magkakatrabaho po yan. Repeat Bago, that. Uh, cognitive. Cognitive, social emotional and, and the technical skills. So, ngayon po yung aming collaboration toward TESDA is actually just focusing on enabling competencies. Ito po yung problem solving, ito yung critical thinking, ito yung numeracy. You know, bumaba na po ako sa TESDA para <laughs> hindi na lang po mga national scientists at saka yeah, nasa ang aking pinapakialaman ngayon. But definitely, it's more of being able to prepare them, to funnel them. But at the same time, kailangan po sa lubungin sa taas. Kailangan po, you have to have the spin-offs. That's why po ang mandate namin sa UP is to create 21 spin-offs in the next three years. We have 21 now, but it took us five years to get there. Dr. Destura is one of our first spin-off in UP who, who has left. But definitely our mandate is to create unicorns. Unicorns will create economic activity and eventually gain employment for a lot of our Filipino. So ang focus po, kung hihingi niyo po ang ginagawa po namin ngayon is training teachers to be able to just be comfortable with AI. Because AI will enable the teachers to be able to teach whatever topic they want. So that's on the education side, on the training uh, for STEM. And then the secondly, on the uh, particular sectors po, ganun pa rin po yung ating specialty. Eh. Yung current discussion po namin sa ADB, uh, uh, clearly ang lumalabas po is ang uh, renewable energy, uh, EV, vehicle ecosystems. You're looking at, the, of course, the healthcare delivery as well as the discovery. Uh, ang ating Tuklas Lunas project po sa DOST. Ako lang ko lang isang billion na yan. At kailangan pong, andyan ang lagundi niya, nandyan ang sambong, but we need to be, elevate our game to be able to have foreign markets accessible with these discoveries as well. And then, uh, the, the other areas, of course, in agriculture, we visited po Israel when I was on the board of the OST SEI. And sabi nila, wala kaming agricultural engineering sa Israel Institute of Technology. But what we have is all disciplines of engineering applying towards agriculture. That's why you can grow bananas in the desert po. So, yung ability lang po natin to partner with the right university that has the right expertise I look at it from the train, from that analogy of the, the, the uh, fast train. Tatlong nirecruit ng China, Shinkansen, uh, TGV, at saka IBT. They all made trains for different sections of China. Nung natapos yung kontrata, labas sila lahat, nasa kanila na yung kaalaman. So hopefully, ganun po yung mangyari sa atin. Ma-recruit po natin yung the right universities and the sectors that we wanted to enable. And then hopefully from there, we can get the knowledge, we operationalize and utilize them for a certain period of time, and then we let them go and we create the companies then that would support and adopt all the human capital that Dr. Giselle Concepcion is asking for. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Cynthia. So I, I think so, uh, following as Al. So, so for the targeted, diba? you liberalize, but you actually know who to invite. For that, I am not, they might not want ownership. They might not 100% 100, 100 ownership. I'm not sure if you say by law that we, you can create a law that for these particular institutions, they can have 100% ownership. I'm not sure about that. But, but for that group, yes. We're not going to attract higher education institutions to this country for many reasons. One, you have a very, even if you have young population, they cannot pay. Your upper class and your middle class is too insignificant to actually pay. So, so, the in, so if they come in here, it might be to bring in foreigners, but they will be foreigners who will not be looking for the good universities. They will be foreigners who will be looking for at least to have a, a degree. Now for maritime, uh, I guess for maritime it's different. The Europeans, for instance, are not going to come in here with a 100%, no, because we're such a vulnerable country. They are, I think they're, and they're already implementing it, they're adopting our schools. In other words, they are saying that this school is accredited by, our, by the Belgian, it's just like us, but they will not come in here because, because our situation is such that Negative nga, negative list nga tayo, tottering always in the brink of a negative list. But that is explicitly there, that's what they used to tell us when I was in the oversight for maritime. 
that this is their plan B. Their plan B, so it's, it's so hopeless that they will now adopt specific maritime schools in the Philippines and accredit them as Norwegian or as, as Dutch. So they're not coming in 100%. So liberalizing, I think we have to be, that's what I'm saying about targeting, target, targeted rather than a fully liberalized. If we only have two applying, I mean, I, it might be good to see who those two are. They are certainly not the universities they want to bring in. But we have to maybe invite universities. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm half, no, I'm serious about maybe think of more PhDs coming from foreign universities without going out of the country so that we don't lose them. But that's one possibility. How would you craft, a, again, with the permission of Senator, how would you craft a program along the lines of what uh, no, so, so uh, our, so to, our, to produce so, with the express goal of producing those uh, postdocs? How do you do that? How do you no, design you, it? I guess, I guess it's not just a postdocs muna because we have to have the docs first. Diba? You don't have PhDs. Maybe if you have several universities, four or five of them, but you have to talk to them. Eh? You have to work it out. It's not like they'll come in because they are, just, maybe they might want to, but anyway, so, okay. Uh, Dr. We, Sarah, are, uh, we are implementing a program right yeah. now from the Meyerhoff uh, where we keep a track for science-inclined students. So, uh, California, when we started under Stride, we had actually identified a program in California that actually identifies gifted kids in high school and they're given a track to get to a PhD. Wag mo nang pagkakawalan, wag mo nang pag-board in, makukuha pa ng industriya, diretso na sa PhD, sustentado. So right now in DOST, that's exactly what we're trying to do. But we need mentors that comes from uh, already experienced PhDs, our past. So you're doing it where, in Philippine science? And, the, and PISAI leading, PISAI. Uh, PISA, I'm a PISAI uh, oh, okay, graduate, yeah. batch 83. So uh, <laughs> uh, I was with Juna Baya, uh, okay. he's my classmate. So yeah. definitely that's a track that we wanted to make sure that there's no fallout. Okay. All the 180 students okay. of PISAI should have been all PhDs. Right, and then right. the 5,000 DOSD scholars should all get to higher degrees if they can. But there's programs and definitely, hopefully, the U.S. Yeah. Secretary can support and vocalize it more uh, yeah. when he comes back. Mr. Uh, with Chair, you, with, with your permission, see si Dr. Santos is uh, raising his hand, yeah? Uh. Good, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chair, Honorable Senators. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, the question of the good senator was, will 100% foreign ownership attract uh, foreign direct investment? So. I would like to cite uh, the RMIT University in Vietnam where when the Prime Minister of Australia visited, they took the opportunity to announce a $250 million fund to support um, partnerships with local companies in Vietnam to share expertise as well. Now when the Prime Minister... Australia was giving the money. No, sir. It Vietnam was, was giving the money. RMIT was University was setting up the fund. RMIT is a... Is uh, the a, Royal Melbourne Institute ah, of so Technology. So it's an Australian... Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, it started out as a polytechnic, then became a university. So if you recall, Mr. Chair, when, when Prime Minister Anthony Albanese visited the Philippines to, to sign the strategic partnership, there was no similar announcement. Now, I only mention this because I work in the startup space in Australia, and we're trying to set up a national center for research. I work with a team of PhDs as well. The thing there is there is a lot of opportunity in green energy, in so many technologies. And as you know, Mr. Chair, the importance of know-how in Ricardo Hausmann's economic complexity model is that it is easier to transfer the brain rather than it's not possible to codify the know-how, it's tacit knowledge. So people-to-people -people exchanges, collaborations, that is the way of the 21st century. So this is what I was talking about, Mr. Chair. It was part of my slides last time, but um, the contrast. So we, for many reasons, should actually be at the forefront of this, Mr. Chair, because of political, cultural reasons. Politically, we're a democracy. We speak English. We're predominantly Christian. 
But, but uh, could you could you take a step back, uh, Dr. Santos, and, and tell us why did they invest that in Australia but not in the Philippines? Uh, sir, because yeah. they already had a presence there. Is it because there are a lot of Australian companies manufacturing there or, or in, in locating there? Maybe, maybe. So it's always about the why, right? So why, why, why? I think that was also presented by the good honorable senator majority leader in his chart where Vietnam and Cambodia were actually lower. So they recognized the gap. They opened themselves up. This is in, from the, from in, in the 2000s. And so they, they welcomed the, the foreign university there. Now, I was told, because I was just in Vietnam visiting one of the faculty there, that during COVID, they used to send students to Australia. But when COVID, the lockdown happened, Down. Borders were closed. So now they're booming. And part of that is because they have there the fashion, they have technology, they have all sorts of departments there. And now this is a 10 billion peso investment fund that they're setting up to set up collaborations. So this is the opportunity, I suppose, Mr. Chair, that we're missing by, by being closed. And Sorry, is it because of uh, ownership, ownership uh, issue, Your Honor? Uh, sir, sir, that's, of course, that's part of it, because yeah. they set up a campus there. So obviously, they were allowed to send uh, Australian, are, yeah. as far no, as I know. No Vietnamese uh, equity. Yeah. Yes, because when Australian universities go, like in Monash, that's in Malaysia, there's and no local participation yes. there. Um, that's right. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, we, this is your time, Senator Wynn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with apologies. So that's fine, that's fine Mr. Chairman. It's, uh... So, sir, that's the, the know-how. What's more important than the capital, than the financial, is actually the expertise. Because they'll, they'll come in, they'll partner, they'll provide mentoring, they'll provide... Um, so many things could come out of that. We cannot predict what will happen, Mr. Chair. So um, we cannot say for sure that there, there is no market or we'll only attract the bad ones. That's what's currently happening, Mr. Chair, because of the restrictions. It's a case of adverse selection. When you make it, just like with the POGOs, when you make it illegal to come in, the only people that will come in are the people, are the shady ones who are willing to risk and pay off, engage in corruption. That's why it was part of my testimony last week that when we try to provide preferential treatment to local players, in our history, that's what has happened, is that corruption ensued. And then it, and, and the, you attract the bad ones. And, um, and so in other places where the corruption is equally rampant, <laughs> the way to deal with it is to just allow for equal competition and allow for new ideas to come in, I suppose. Sir. Mr. Chair, with the indulgence of Sen Sherwin, just a quick point. Salamat po. Unfortunately, the POGO is a really bad example to compare our discussion with because even the legitimate POGOs who had um, permits from PAGCOR, hundreds, some of them thousands, of human trafficking and scam hubs took shelter uh, under them. So maybe, maybe it's not I a good example. Point, but, Thank but, you, but, Dr. But I, Santos. But my next slide, it talks about the R&D desert that exists. If you could go to the next slide. Um, this is also, who's handling the slides? If the, there is a, uh, we, we lack the R&D um, infrastructure now. Our innovation ecosystem is really, we are probably like so, the last in terms yeah. of the rankings. Um, we invest very little capital in R&D because the emphasis is in providing access to education rather than in um, conducting R&D. And so this is what the foreign universities can provide. I think that's already been established. So Thank you. Thank you. Can we go back to Senator Wynn because... Uh, it, it, we're running out of time for before our plenary session. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I, I understand from Dr. Santos and Mr. Serafica that the uh, simple answer is yes, when we uh, open up ownership 100% to foreign institutions, then there is 
great potential for foreign schools to come here to the Philippines and bring hard investments, so FDIs. And of course, in the process, you also develop your other educational components such as research uh, and the other facets. Now, I want to ask either Dr. Sa uh, Dr. Santos or Mr. Serafica, what is the market size? What is the potential FDI that we are looking at? I don't know if you have that answer right now. So, for example, if the global education industry is you know, X dollars, how much are we looking at in terms of bringing it in to the Philippines? Uh, is there any, any one of our resource persons can respond? No? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, sir, the, the, it's hard to put a dollar figure in it, but what I was trying to get at earlier uh, was that we have a lot tremendous goodwill currently given the, the geopolitical situation. Um, and we are, not, uh, we are not deriving as much benefit from that goodwill. I mentioned the political, cultural aspects. We should actually be m m more integrated than our neighbors are. But for some reason, we aren't. And, and therefore, we, can't, we are not able to get the, the, the flow of investment. Um, it is very difficult to predict, sir, what will happen, but it, it's, it's hard to put numbers on it. But because there are, but if we just take the example of, of uh, Vietnam, once you open up, you, you create that possibility. We, if you don't, then it's not, then the, the possibility is zero. That's the figure that we know of, that currently this is what exists. Can I request from both gentlemen to help us, help the committee to come up with some figures? I am sure there's some uh, research out there uh, simulating or estimating how big is the education, global education industry. And not only for educational purposes, but also for um, for commercial purposes, no? because we all know that some some schools are uh, engaged in commercial activities or for profit activities. No? So, my, my I, not on this uh, hearing, but if we can uh, help us also come up with that number, so that we can have that that number in our minds that okay, when we open, this is the potential. So that's uh, like to help seek the help of the of, of uh, the two gentlemen, and we, Mr. Chairman, yeah, we'll we'll call on uh, Doctor uh, Mr. Serapio and then uh, Doctor uh, Likwanan. Uh, we did have a initial indicator for the R and D ecosystems for different comparable countries, but again, the, it's a two-step process, Senator, in the sense that you welcome a very directed, selected higher education institutions with existing partners of industries that you want to come in. And by doing so, you create a credibility to these companies to come in because they say, like, I'm partnering with MIT. I'm developing Industry 4.0 curriculum to be implemented in industry. And if I do that, I talk to the semiconductor industry in the U.S. afterwards saying that, hey, we train now workers under Industry 4.0 with partnership with MIT. Why don't you come here and put up a microfab plant? Then that's when the FDI comes. So it's a, it's a two-step process. I don't think opening up for universities to come here will create a lot of foreign direct investments, honestly. But I think by being able to have directed partnerships with foreign universities that can bring in the real FDIs, the real players. One example that I was in the U.S. last year, we were looking at uh, Arizona uh, Tech Voc School, community college called Westmec, and the hoops that they went to to recruit TSMC, which is the Taiwan Semiconductor for the CHIPS Act of the United States, that they were even sending high school students from Arizona to OJT in Taiwan to just demonstrate to Taiwan that if you bring the fab plant in Phoenix, we will have the workforce for you. But that's the kind of 
almost like a three-level chess game or, or a, a, a three whys. Why are you doing this? Why are we opening up for foreign directed? It's because we wanted to be able to get the expertise and eventually recruit the FDIs that they're partnered with in their own respective countries. And why is that? Because it's going to create new jobs and economic activity that are... What important. company, sir? What company was uh, that? The, that example was TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, which is the biggest semiconductor company. And that's the kind of courting and the way the school in Arizona mentioned, it took them three years to even have a full plan for how to educate the workforce just for a single company. So, but that's kind of a adv very advanced planning and very strategic in terms of recruitment. We need to be that strategic and directed, almost laser focus on who we want to recruit. Uh, oh, that's all I'm saying. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, that's the second school of thought that I mentioned earlier, that maybe it will not bring no, so much FDIs, foreign direct investments, but it is a tool to develop our human capital, and then later on, uh, that human capital will contribute to our economic development. It's longer in terms of horizon, but it uh, creates much bigger value in the long run because you have you know, higher, level, um, uh, higher level skills that are being uh, taught to our constituents. Um, Dr. Likwana, you were raising your hands. No, I, I really had a question uh, because I, I think that is a major assumption that if we open up, uh, the foreign universities will come, uh, assuming that, they, that ownership is desirable for them. But if I were a foreign university, if I can get what I need and what I want, why would I risk ownership if I can get it through partnership? So I think that is the assumption that we are making, which I would question, that really, that they want to own. Wouldn't you, if you were an investor, less, less, want to lessen your risks uh, because of all of the risks? We are, we are a country that is a high risk, high gain, let's face it. So if you can just partner and, you know, work out innovative uh, programs and get your end of the deal, why do you need to own? That is, I think, an assumption that I question. Mr. Chairman, do we have anyone from TESDA present? Father Innocencio was the one sent by uh, <laughs> Secretary. If, if, if not, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask anyone. Yeah. Is, is the, is we have TESDA man here. Ah, yes. TESDA man, yeah. yeah. Definitely, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, the most experienced and the um, authority in uh, TechVoc. No, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if I can, if anyone can answer this. Can Tesla schools be owned 100 percent by foreign companies? The TechVoc schools, because no, Tesla school, Tesla does uh, 123 uh, uh, training institutions. And now Tesla is the the private uh, the private, the private no, deliverer can, of no, uh, TechVoc. They, they and, sixty forty. That's what I, I I asked that because when when the chairman mentioned about cybersecurity, and cybersecurity you don't need a diploma to to um, to to acquire knowledge and skills in cybersecurity. All you need are vocational TechVoc uh, skills development institutions. But uh, a lot of these institutions are also foreign-run or foreign-trained or uh, foreign-developed. Uh, and uh, that's, I can see that is an opportunity for uh, private, foreign private tech book schools to set up here fairly quickly and, and um, train our uh, future workforce with skills that uh, we will need for the future. No? So, uh, I wanted to ask Tess that, uh, about that uh, issue, and maybe next time, Mr. Chairman, we can invite Testa to, to uh, uh, share their thoughts on this um, topic. Um, Mr. Chairman, my, I, I think we're running out of time, but my last question for this um, uh, session. Senator Wynn, just to put on record, yeah. yung TVET pwede dun sa transnational uh, law, kasama sila that they can actually... Uh, uh, partner with the uh, foreign institutions. Not ownership. Not ownership. Not ownership. So that's an, that's one opportunity 
that I can see um, for private tech walk foreign. Transnational private. allows ownership, but only 6040. Only 6040, correct, correct. Mr. Chairman, again, I would like to throw this to our steam resource persons. Um, with your permission, I was informed see Dr. Coelho is raising his hand. Perhaps it's in response to your question. Yes, Mr. Maybe we can ask him. Uh, Dr. Coelho? Uh, yes? Yes, yes it is. thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Gatchali, and I appreciated your, your question because I think that's one systematic way by which to evaluate this. Um, may I suggest to the subcommittee to get in touch with the Board of Investments I know that this is an educational matter, but there are experts in terms of evaluating uh, investment opportunities uh, you know, around the globe, including, of course, in Southeast Asia. And, and I think that they would be very helpful in this regard. It's a good idea. Um, we'll do that. Yeah. Along I with quickly Tesla. googled uh, Stadista, yeah. and I got this information here. In Southeast Asia, uh, the total revenue in education market is projected to reach 43 or 44 million U.S. dollars in 2022, and it's growing, uh, growing at a rate of about 11 uh, percent. That's CAGR 2022 to 2027. Uh, I think it's important for the subcommittee to be educated in the investment potential of education uh, in, in Southeast Asia, and and BOI can help with that. Thanks. It's a good idea. Thank you, Dr. Kaya. Maybe. Um you can do five, five minutes, is that all right? And then we can uh, wrap up because the uh, majority leader is kicking my leg under the table. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr. So Chairman, th this is an easy, I think, uh, related but easy question to, uh, for our resource person. Best practices. Um, I, I, we, uh, Dr. Santos mentioned about Vietnam earlier. And Vietnam, I understand, allows 100% ownership uh, for educational institutions. Uh, the United Arab Emirates also allows 100% ownership. In fact, um, there are some foreign schools that operate in the UAE, uh, NYU, Abu Dhabi, Sorbonne, I think uh, Dr. Sarafrika mentioned that earlier, and then London business schools. Maybe not the, the super well-known, but uh, foreign schools that cater probably to very specific market and specific niches. No? So, I'd like to ask the uh, body for, for best practices that we can look at, do you have, aside from Vietnam, no? you, aside from the UAE, what other jurisdictions allow foreign direct, 100% foreign ownership in educational institutions? And they are actually reaping the benefits. And also on the other side, maybe the, the disadvantage to foreign 100% uh, foreign ownership in educational institutions. Any, any, any from the body? Dr. Cynthia? Se Senator Wynn, uh, Singapore. Singapore is really reaping it, but as, as mentioned earlier, Singapore invested. Uh, Singapore has different arrangements. There are some arrangements where they fully cover everything. NUS, uh, Yale, uh, NUS, Duke University, or they invite, they invited the uh, Institute of Munich, the Technological Institute to develop their engineering. But they allow private institutions, but they're very, very, very selective. And in recent years, uh, there's a study that says in recent years, because they already know. In the beginning, they were inviting because they wanted to develop strategic areas. And now that they have the human resource for it, they already know exactly what they want out of the ones who are coming in. In fact, there's one institution that was not complaining, but saying they're now being told uh, to actually develop nursing. So the, the fields are very specific. So it's very, it's very, uh, it's very- San Puyan, Dr. Bautista. Singapore, is... Singapore. They're, they're very targeted, but they're earning, they're earning from it. I mean, they're gaining from it, even in terms of the high value high value because that's for them their human resource is their only resource and that they have to always be in the high value chain and because of that they have to get the institutions that will make them high value and 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 the ecosystem is is something that the government is really pouring its resources into just to just to conclude uh, one of the one of our greatest potential is to is the command of English. And uh, I think um, by attracting some of these uh, foreign institutions to come here, we also attract their own citizens uh, to come here 
uh, learn their academic uh, requirements at the same time also learn English. Um, I, I, I remember attending a graduation ceremony by, I think it was Perpetual Help um, College, where in 40% of the students there were Chinese studying MBA. The other 40% were Indians studying med school, and the 20% were Filipinos. And I, I, the, the reason for that, partly uh, for, their pop, uh, for the popularity of that, uh, of that school, is also they learn English when they come here. No? So at the same time, they pick up uh, that skill that uh, will enable them to uh, be successful in their field in the future. Probably they will work abroad uh, later on. So that's also one aspect that uh, uh, I'm looking at, uh, Mr. Chairman, in this discussion. So I'll continue my other question, Mr. Chairman, in the next uh, hearing, but thank you very I much. I think uh, that's a good point, Senator Gatshalen. I think UP has a lot of Indians, right? Uh, some med school, a lot of Indian enrollees, no? I remember we were, who was our resource person back then. He was telling us that there was an interest from, the, the, from India. <laughs> So, yeah, any last words? Uh, yes, Dr. Gonzalez, let's keep it brief, the last words, yeah. Senator so, Wynn. Yeah, we have session at three, actually. <laughs> I shared uh, my innovation proposal with you when we visited you, and uh, I talked about it earlier, and I think that uh, one way that we could uh, invite the foreign uh, experts over for know-how and knowledge and know-how is through that uh, uh, Philippine Advanced uh, uh, Innovation Institute for Industry. So it would be focused on our priority areas of development in industry. And in fact, uh, a PPP arrangement there, again, not ownership, but partnership, uh, including with foreign uh, industries, uh, would be possible because um, they have an interest uh, to make their uh, investments, their FDI here grow. For example, uh, the BOI now has over one trillion peso uh, investment or promises for for investment by the German government, 390 billion pesos. The Netherlands, U.S. companies, 330 billion pesos. Local companies, 300 billion pesos, etc. And they would be interested in uh, getting a uh, skilled workforce here to grow their business. So, in fact, I've got uh, gotten some feedback from the DTI that there might be, uh, in fact, um, foreign companies that would like to invest in that uh, institute. And a part of that would be uh, training because they have to uh, produce the workforce to support uh, the growth of their uh, investments here. And um, well, Intel left us many years ago and uh, they needed our uh, masters and PhD graduates from physics. They were very happy with our graduates, but there were just like you know, a handful of them and they needed more. So that plus our energy cost and other bureaucratic problems, uh, they uh, decided that Vietnam is much better than the Philippines and they're gone. So that's just an example of the ecosystem that we are trying to uh, create uh, here and uh, that needs to be improved uh, by a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank you to our colleagues, Senator Wynn, Majority Leader, Senator Risa, who was here from the start, uh, Senator Bato and Senator Tolentino earlier. And to our resource persons, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to share your thoughts with us. We'll suspend the meeting until uh, next week. Thank you very much.